If you're listening to this, this is a very unconventional episode of the Snarp Fangle Podcast. David, what are you drinking right now? I am drinking a delicious Sierra Nevada Summerfest mm-hmm. at 10 o'clock in the morning. At 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and as somebody who um, would grab one of those but doesn't really like, like, I don't know, beer, I guess, I'm like, well, what's hard and something I can just drink right now in the morning? And I'm like... And I'm going to set up with an Arizona green tea. So, which is funny. I just noticed on the can, David, where it says a hundred percent natural is the comic sans font. What? Yeah. Look, <laughs> see, it says a hundred percent natural comic. Sans. Also. Oh, oh, where it says green tea. That's also comic sans. I don't think that's comic sans. It looks like common sans. I think that's Arizona's own proprietary font. <laughs> proprietary font. <laughs> You know, Arizona, they love their proprietary fonts. <laughs> well, I mean, how else do you think they uh how else do you think they keep prices so low in Ooh. tough times such as these, if not by owning everything under their purview, including the fonts on the can. It makes me wonder if like other companies such as Pepsi or Coke or heck, even big corporations like have their own font created and they just or if you wonder if they have to even pay licenses for some fonts out there because it seems to be free for fonts. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's free for uh, the fonts that are available to the public, mm. and then you pay. I'm I'm assuming, I'm assuming if you pay a designer to create a font for you, then it's your font, and you can mm-hmm. either give it away mm. or um, charge people for it. Which that's not really a thing anymore, but. Back in the day, you used to buy fonts. Yeah. I remember hearing about that, actually. I wasn't alive. I was alive probably when it was going on. But, yeah, I remember hearing about that. It makes me think of, uh, <laughs> you know, James, you know Avatar, right? The movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know how the logo was Comic Sans? <laughs> no. Or no, not Comic Sans. It was Papyrus. It was Papyrus. Oh, no. Oh, never... that's what I'm thinking of, David. It's Papyrus. Oh, Okay, yeah, it's okay. papyrus, hundred percent natural. That's okay, I was thinking. gonna say sorry, that. Sorry, it does not look like comic. Yeah, sand. that's that's definitely papyrus font right there. Because I mean, remember when the end of High Avatar, like zoom, da dun dun, hey ha, like when the credits hit, it says Avatar. It's totally like papyrus, like hmm, straight up. Interesting. And they actually interviewed James Cameron. Like, uh, was it, how long ago did the second one come out? A couple years ago. Anyway, they asked him. They said, "What did? You, what was the choice behind the uh, the 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 papyrus font of the first movie?" And he said, "Oh, um, well, what it came to me, and they uh, they showed it to me as a concept, and I said, looks good, and I greenlit it, and I proved it, and I didn't ask any <laughs> questions, and then later somebody brought it up, and yeah, then we had to change it for the next one. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> He's like, I mean, when you're James Cameron and you're making a three hundred million dollar movie." You're probably like tired, I would assume, at some points in meetings. So, anyway, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome back to yet another episode of the Snarp Fangle Podcast. I am your host, Jacques A. Metzger, along with David. It's David. It's Mr. David over here. David, how you doing? Mm. Excellent, excellent. Abra of grave nectar. In my veins, inject it thy way. I just woke up, so yeah. <laughs> that, that was uh, completely unintelligible, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, today we have one heck of a show for you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode something of the uh, Snart Fangle. And uh, if you are not aware, we bring a topic of discussion to the audience of the internet, the congregation, per se, to you guys listening. And our topic today is actually me and David. And we're just, uh, we're, we've had a lot of guests on this show, a lot of third chairs, a lot of third wheels, David, like Thaddeus Metzger, that, that, that UPS brown suited driving mofo. That guy is a, he's a great man. I love him. He's my brother. But man, it's, it's been a while since we've had you and me on. Just, just, just David and Jake. Indeed it has. And so long. So today I kind of just want to, I just want to catch up with you, David, and, and, and me. And uh, yeah, we'll just go through it. I do want to kind of bring up something just to throw it out there. I was listening to a podcast this morning. And they were talking about video games and they were talking about how some 
very young Zoomers are saying that the Wii U generation was the golden era of Nintendo. As well as, <laughs> as well as, right. as that was that sounded like that sounded like like it was a it sounded like a fortune or something. It sounded like a fortune post, you know. I mean, <laughs> oh anyway. God. So I was listening to that, and then a couple days before that, David, I was listening to uh, this other guy. Shout out to Julian Melshenik, I believe his name is on YouTube. I think Coffee with Dads or Coffee Talk is his name. He just makes a cup of coffee and talks about video games. He's a big Steam Deck stand. But anyway, he was talking about how he obsessively will watch any movie from the 1990s. And, you know, he's about in his Any third, movie? Any like, movie. Literally I'm any, any movie? I'm talking any movie. Like, he's a big Adam Sandler guy. He kind of reminds me a little bit of Thad. He's in his 30s, has a couple kids. But it's making me wonder about generations and the, the power of nostalgia as well as... Um, I don't know, kind of like the fondness we look back on the past, but was it really the good times is my question. Mm. What do you think, David? What do you think of all this? I mean, nostalgia is a powerful force. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, and what's interesting, too, is nostalgia can work in ways which um, are kind of um, inexplicable, too. Like, for me personally, I remember growing up, I mean, I was a, I started... I started, uh, you know, really forming my own musical taste probably in the early 2000s. And that's when I started listening to rock radio instead of whatever my parents were listening to. And I was always a fan of like the 90s grunge era. Oh, yeah. So the the radio station had like this um, 90s at noon or something like that segment. And I would always tune in for that. And so, but there was one band, one of the more classic bands from the 90s, some of you might recognize, a band called Stone Temple Pilots. They made it pretty big back in the day. Um, though That was a band where I was kind of ambivalent towards, you know? I was like, they're, they're pretty cool. They're not bad, but I'm like, mm, they're not my favorite. But then now, as a, as a grown man, whenever I hear Stone Temple Pilots, I'm like instantly sucked back into my childhood. Ooh. It's weird. It's total nostalgia, even though at the time where I was forming my musical taste and I was listening to this band, I didn't particularly care for them. Mm. It's it kind of kind of goes to show you how powerful of a hold nostalgia can be for people. Mm. Yeah, it reminds me of when I was um when I was a little kid and I, I was homeschooled and for one of our, we had to do typing stuff in the day, and so I would sit at mom's computer, and I would kind of, to practice my typing to get used to the keyboard when I was little, I would listen to music and transcribe music and write down all the lyrics in a doc, and so that would be my typing for the day. So I'd do one or two songs per day, and I remember specifically the Al City songs, his first album, Ocean Eyes, his first studio album, I believe. He did a ton of singles before that, but anyway, I was listening to like Ocean Eyes, that whole album. And it's just super, when I put on Tidal Wave or Cave In or The Bird and the Bee or Dental Care, any of those songs, whenever I put any of those on, I'm instantly transported back to that corner of my parents' room on the computer on Word 05 or something and just writing down the lyrics. And it's just, it's weird because it transports me back to a certain place in my life almost locationally versus just fuzzy feelings. I still have fuzzy feelings for lots of other stuff, but it's funny how the dynamics of nostalgia are different too. Like it'll transport you to the certain place in time. It'll transport you back to your childhood. It'll transport you back to your teenage years or whatever, or two years old when you're, <laughs> I was going to say like two years old when your parents were fighting and you vividly remember it like in high anxiety. <laughs> I don't hate heights. I hate parents. <laughs> God, it's been so long since I've seen that movie. Oh, well, yeah, this is the kind of episode you're getting into. So we're just going to, we're going to go out of there. But what do you remember from my anxiety, David? <laughs> um, <laughs> high anxiety. <laughs> Let's see. I think uh, for me, <laughs> I think for me, the most memorable, memorable part was the, uh, was the, um, 
Oh. The BDSM scene? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, um, the fight? Like the boxing match? No. Oh, God. I'm, I'm trying to think of the movie. <laughs> sorry, I'm just, I'm just... I'm trying to think of the movie title. Um, oh, uh, Mel, Mel Brooks. No, the movie oh. title oh. that it draws from. Oh, High Society. No, 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 what? no, what? no, no, no. Oh, <laughs> what are you talking about a specific scene in High oh, Anxiety? Oh, oh, okay, okay. And it draws from a specific Hitchcock movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um there's God. quite a few. It's uh, like literally the most famous one. The Birds, I, the most famous one. That's oh, the, the mo- second most famous <laughs> one. A Psycho. Psycho. Yes. Psycho. There we go. Yes. The scene that is a parody of the stabbing scene in Psycho, where Mel Brooks is taking a shower. <laughs> And the bellboy comes in with a newspaper that <laughs> Mel Brooks had asked for and beats him over the head with the newspaper <laughs> while he's in the shower. And then it ends with the, uh, with the ink running down the drain <laughs> as, a, uh, as a parody of the, yeah. uh, of the blood running down the drain oh, in Psycho. <laughs> that, that, I think, was like... That, that right there, I think, is my favorite scene in the whole movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like... Oh, man. <laughs> I haven't seen that in so long. I've only seen it once, but I remember it was the only Mel Brooks film I believe we watched as like a family. It was like the only like one my parents thought was like probably one of the cleaner ones, I would guess I would say, even though I mentioned the BDSM scene, but we fast forward that part. But anyway, that's a, that's a good movie. It's a good film. I love Mel Brooks. Did you, did you hear that Blazing Saddles is getting a 4K release this year? No, I didn't hear it that. Is. I am excited about yeah, that. Yeah, this like fall, it's got a special edition and everything, like collector set. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. Yeah. What's interesting though about high anxiety, not to uh, switch gears too soon, but uh, what's interesting about high the anxiety RPMs are already high. <laughs> is um, that I guess Alfred Hitchcock himself was quite a fan of the movie. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. In fact, he sent, if I remember correctly, he sent like a. Like a like um what do they call it? a magnum or whatever like I can't I I'm not a wine person oh, I don't know the oh, times oh, yeah, yeah, of yeah. like um of like certain a certain expensive wine as a gift um actually sent Mel Brooks a gift of like expensive wine as a way of saying thank you for the for making the movie so that I felt that was kind of interesting because normally parody is kind of like parody isn't something that people normally really invite with open arms. Mm. Like there's certain people like w- in the music world weird weird Al Yankovic is one Ooh, yeah. where artists sort of invite him to parody their songs because it generally has an effect on the popularity of the of the songs themselves. Mm. Um but other than rare cases like that, I feel like parody isn't really a thing that most people openly invite. So I really thought that was interesting that Alfred Hitchcock, the guy whose work was being parodied in High Anxiety, was like, man, I really like this. And I like it enough to send an expensive thank you present to the guy who made it. (laughs) That's the epic rap battles I want to see is Weird Al Yankovic versus Mel Brooks. I think that'd be a that'd be a fight of the century right there. But I think kind of bringing up High Society as a tangent kind of ties into nostalgia a little bit, having it be a parody and all. You look at something like High Anxiety, and it parodies the Hitchcock films, and people love the Hitchcock films, and they're like, "Oh, I get that," and you know, it go they they understand it, they they accept it, and they um they kind of enjoy it for what it is, you know, and it takes the good writing and the good um good good use of callbacks, we'll say, David, to really make nostalgia really play to your advantage, versus other bad examples like more modern takes of nostalgia. I would suggest Ghostbusters would be a good example of bad, bad examples of nostalgia playing out. Mm. I think of the 2016 reboot with Melissa McCarthy and all them trying to really, really hard, like to pander almost necessarily, even though you can tell they kind of love it, but it's kind of, it was kind of messed up. And I think a lot of ways that film yeah, there's other examples, but that's just for thing. Comes I by. mean, the the thing about that film that really I think is the problem for me is that it completely misses uh, the tone of the originals, and so it's not really an homage to the originals. It's like a shameless 
shameless sort of like, I'm going to steal this IP and do my own random crappy thing with it. I think it's definitely a poster child for copying something to the extent of, because parody requires a certain flattery, I would, I would, I would assume. And parody, I think, um, requires you to have some kind of appreciation for the thing mm. you're parodying. E- even further than understanding, an appreciation, I think, is where you're nailing that. And a good parody, a good parody builds on the strengths of what made the thing that you're parodying, of the thing that you appreciate about what you're parodying uh, while bringing, you know, whatever it is, your particular flair that you bring to the table as the creator of the parody work. Mm, mm. I think it brings me back to the thought of the golden age of certain things. Like I think of bands. I've listened to a lot of early newsboys recently. And, and even you go through the Queen uh, discography, like they didn't hit their stride till later. Newsboys didn't hit their stride till about the third or fourth album in the mid nineties. Queen didn't hit their stride until I don't know when. I'm not that versed on Queen, but well, I'm gonna go with A Night at the Opera since that's right. the album that Bohemian Rhapsody was on. Okay, well, that's probably a pretty good, uh, pretty good indicator of when they hit their stride. Yeah, yeah. So it's like I don't ever hear people talk about the very early albums of Genesis at all, for example, or even the early, early, early albums of Queen. It's well, mostly just the best hits. That's the thing about Genesis is such an interesting example because Genesis's early discography is unknown to most people. Oh yeah. Because they existed in a very specific time in the late 70s in uh Great well, was Britain. Was it late 60s actually? No, it was right? the uh it was the it was the late 70s. Oh, the late 70s. Okay. It was uh they were part of the original wave of English progressive rock bands. So the progressive rock movement started in the 70s in England and um, Genesis was kind of part of that scene. And then, but it was kind of like a short-lived thing. Like Mm -hmm. it never made waves. It never really made huge waves in the music industry. And most bands didn't, uh, didn't make it big. But what's interesting is certain bands from that era made it big, but they didn't make it big till the 80s when they switched from progressive rock to being more pop-oriented. Mm. And Genesis is a great example of that because Genesis was the, uh, the start of both Peter Gabriel and Phil Collins' career. Yeah. Peter Gabriel was the lead singer of Genesis and Phil Collins was the drummer. Mm -hmm. And then what ended up happening is Genesis had its sort of heyday, early heyday in the progressive rock scene, didn't go very far. I mean, they, they achieved some notoriety for sure, but nothing, nothing major. And then what ended up happening is Peter Gabriel leaves Genesis. He starts, he starts producing his own um, solo music with um, a more pop sound, and he hits it big with, um, I believe the album is So, mm. which has songs like Sledgehammer and uh, In Your Eyes, you know, the one, the famous one with the movie scene and the guy holding oh, up the oh. boombox oh, in the window. Oh, that's the Say Anything song? Yes. Oh, okay. All yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And Sweet. then what ends up happening is um, Phil Collins departs to do the same thing. Mm. He starts his own solo pop career and hits uh, hits it big with um, In the Air Tonight. Oh, yeah. He hits it hard. And then Genesis <laughs> is kind of forgotten about until Phil Collins comes back and resurrects and resurrects Genesis as a uh, as a more pop group and becomes the lead singer. I didn't know he came back. Yeah. Wow. Is that where we get like invisible and stuff like that in Genesis? Yes. This was in the eighties. Yeah. This yeah, late eighties. Yeah. 
Something like that. Dang, I did not know that. David, do you know Professor of Rock on YouTube? No. Oh my God. I did. You got to follow this guy. He's like, he has a video every week, I believe. And he and analyzes classic rock and certain songs and uh, albums and bands and the history and context and the drama involving all of that. He just did one. He says he's not a fan of ABBA, but he just did a, vi a video about ABBA and the song specifically, Winner Takes It All. And he dived into the history of that song and the context of it. And he said, he's like, I'm not a fan of ABBA. It's like my least favorite band. But you guys in the community, he has a Patreon and everything. He said, you guys told me to dive into the history of Winner Takes It All, and I did, and it's fascinating. But he has other stuff, too, tons. And he has interviews with uh, famous musicians, stuff like that. Type up Professor of Rock on YouTube. Highly recommended if you're into any like musical history, that kind of thing, especially in the last 50 years. But I, I say that because... It's interesting how things come back and forth because in Winter Takes All in the history, I'm not going to spoil too much of it, but you should go watch the video, but it involves the song being written by the, uh, the, the male counterpart of the ABBA band, the main male lead, who recently divorced, who was married to the main who, Lady ABBA, the reason why the band's named after, the main female singer of ABBA. I don't know these names, but anyway, they got a bad divorce. And then he writes Winner Takes It All from the hurt of this divorce. And then, they're still part of the band, by the way, at this point. And as they're going through this divorce, he writes this song. And he usually doesn't write his songs under the influence. He usually just does it straight sober. But for this one, he did drink some brandy or something and wrote a bunch of lyrics. And it's fascinating because as you go through it, he writes the song, right? He does a cover of it to kind of get it, get it going, and people really like him, his version of it. But then he thinks, no, I think Abba, my former wife, should be the main singer. And it's like she's the one that eventually ends up singing this song, Winner Takes It All, that he wrote about their divorce. Mm -hmm. And she is super professional about it, does it, gets the takes done and recorded, and doesn't like cry or anything. And she does it super, super profesh. And it's just a fascinating story. You got to dive into it. Professor of Rock on YouTube. Super cool, but weird. Yeah. That sounds like some uh, Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. On the chain kind Doesn't of stuff. It? Dude. Yeah. Like, ah, uh, which is like one of the most, I mean, I, I don't, I've listened to everything out there, but that's one of the most powerful, whether it be a good or bad, but one of the most powerful songs just you can feel it as they're performing it, especially the live version and all that stuff, which I think the actual recorded version is live. Correct me if I'm wrong. Of the uh, chain. Of, of the, the chain? chain? I, I think don't, it is. I don't think it is. No, okay. I think the one I grew up with was live, but yeah, I think the actual version is not. Okay, yeah, whatever. Um, but yeah, speaking of fuzzy feeling nostalgia about certain things, um... Oh, dang it. David, I lost my train of thought. Professor of Rock distracted me. <laughs> dang you, Professor of Rock. <laughs> um, do you have any examples, David, I was going to ask you this, of any music that you did not listen to as a child or in the era of your grunge 90s metal or rock or whatever, um, but you discovered one later in the same era? Has that been an example of you for music or movies or songs you didn't grow up or movies or films or whatever you didn't grow up with, but you discovered later as in a new adulthood? What was your reaction to that? And does it give you any form, warm, fuzzy feelings to that? Um, let's see. Well, I guess. I can give you an example if you need, need time. Um, at least in the case of music, I can think of. See, the 90s is a real, real sort of nostalgic genre for me in general. Um, mm. Which is interesting because I grew up, I really started appreciating 90s music in the, the early 2000s. Like when I was like a teenager, so like 2002, 2003 is kind of where I really started appreciating 90s music. Um, but yeah. But then later on, when I reached adulthood, I had uh, transitioned into 
um, being primarily like this, this would have been in my like, like early twenties, like around that time, like where it was like 20, 21, I had transitioned to being like more of a metalhead. Mm. And what's interesting, what's interesting. I just brushed the mic. I hope that doesn't show up on the recording. <laughs> um, what's interesting is that as I got more and more into metal, I started getting into metal bands from the 90s that I never listened to growing up because I was not listening to metal when I was growing up. Um, so stuff like, I think a big one for me was uh, the band Neurosis. Oh. If you're, if anyone who is a, who can, can appreciate the heavier side of things, go listen to Neurosis. Mm. Um, if I had to recommend one album as like the absolute one to listen to, it would probably be A Sun That Never Sets, mm. which I believe came out in 2001. So not in the 90s, but a lot of their work is in the 90s. Neurosis. Yeah, but yeah, so Neurosis, um, I discovered that later, even though they got started in like 88, 87, something like that. So they've been around for a while, and I just was unaware of their existence as a child. But as soon as I got into them, I really, really got into them. And um, I would say, I would say that my now as a, you know, as a much more grown adult than I was at, you know, 20, 21 years old, I, um, I can say that now what in in a place where I'm no longer would consider myself like a metal head per se. Mm, mm. Um, every man has a choice, David. (laughs) Now (laughs) every man has a choice in their younger years to go two directions. (laughs) It's either metal head or emo. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you've God cho- I never went you've emo. Chose, you've chosen correctly. All right, but yeah, so now I, so now what's really interesting is listening sometimes, so I don't really listen to a whole lot of metal anymore, but now when I listen to certain bands from the 90s like Neurosis, oh. that can trigger uh, oh. feelings of nostalgia for me. Oh, cool. <laughs> Nostalgia <laughs> button's been pressed. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry. Even though I didn't, this so green can, tea, this green tea is doing something to me. I so. yeah, I can tell you're <laughs> getting. You're getting I, I should be drinking that. You uh, get frisky should be, over I there. should be drinking your Summerfest right now <laughs> instead of one of these Arizonas. But yeah, it's interesting that uh, certain bands like that actually can. Certain bands like that actually trigger nostalgia for me, even though I didn't listen to them. Until I was an adult. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been going through actually a bunch of 90s music recently. I've been going through the discography of Smash Mouth. <laughs> oh, Lord. And, and I've been like going through it and going through it, man. And, I, <laughs> and, and I've been walking on that sun every time I listen to one of them CDs. But anyway, I've been, I've been thoroughly underwhelmed, but I've been... Pleasantly surprised, if that makes sense, to going through certain discographies. I remember I wanted to do that with the Beastie, uh, not Beastie Boys, um, ACDC. I wanted to do that with ACDC recently, and I started, or it's one of those things where you download those albums on whatever music player or whatever music streaming app you have, and you're like, I'm going to listen to this, man. And then it just goes further down your your list in your library, and you're like, I don't think I'm ever going to get to it. Uh, if I could say something. Mm. Um <laughs> I would, uh, I would, uh, I would, uh, say that it's probably a good thing that ACDC has just fallen off your radar because as much <laughs> as I am nostalgic for certain ACDC tunes, mm-hmm. if, if I'm honest, Ooh. they release <gasps> the same album every time. Oh, dang, David. Whoa. So, um, that I, as someone who's listened to quite a lot of their work, mm. I would not, I would say it's not worth it to go through their discography. 
It's Just funny. It, no, you stick go. Stick with go. the hits. Stick, stick with, with the, the hits. hits. Okay, okay. Because mm-hmm. I'm like, I wonder what other treasures are in these There's discs. None. <laughs> There's <laughs> these none. These vinyls, man. <laughs> oh. I remember when I discovered, um, you ever heard of Jurassic Five, the rap group? Yes, yes, I have. And I've, I've kind of fallen in love with them in my, in my adult life when I discovered them several years ago. And I just, I love them so, so much. They're just awesome. And then I found Charlie Tuna, who's the, the best sounding voice of that five person group, is like just still doing stuff. And he's awesome. And he's like a, He's like, you know, a veteran of the rap scene and he's just super got this voice that that Mufasa style voice that mm. just ooh, it just goes right through. It just hits your soul and it starts making a melody on it, tapping it on your heart and your brain and you're like, "Oh man, this guy knows how to make a beat. He knows how the flow works." And he's just awesome. And I think of those guys, I think they were strictly 90s. But I have no nostalgia for them but I've been listening to them for the last probably seven years now. And I'm at the point where I'm kind of like, Oh yeah, I remember the song from seven <laughs> years ago. You know what I mean? But I think it, it brings up a thing uh, that I was thinking of where I feel like people who have nostalgia for something that was 10 years ago is interesting to me. Like, like right now it's 2024. People aren't necessarily nostalgia for things in 2014, but I'm actually, in fact, the most nostalgia thing you'll, the most, the people you will see the most nostalgic for that era are people who were kids during those times. Um, but what I will say is I'm starting to find things from 10 years ago and being like, oh, I didn't know about this, or I didn't hear about this game, or, oh, I didn't know this song came out at that point, or, you know, some of the pop stuff that, that, that I remember listening to at that era, well, it kind of comes back and hits me really well, you know? But it's weird because it's not like, you know, 20 years ago or when I was a child, you know, it's, it's, it's just starting to come back. I don't know. Do you have any experience in that? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something you maybe listened to maybe seven years ago and you're like, oh, before pandemic. And you're like, I remember listening to this. This was dope. And I haven't listened to it in six years. Hmm. Or maybe it's a movie. 2014. That was a long time ago. Sounded like you threw out your back there or something. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Not the Arizona. No. <laughs> oh. oh. <laughs> Sweet iced tea. <laughs> Granny's peach tea. Oh, God. Um, uh, I don't know. I can't <laughs> say that. I can't say that I'm all that nostalgic for much from 2014. I mean, let's let me see. Yeah, where, what was going on? What was going on in 2014? Where was I it's in 2014? A, it was um, a, two years after election year, two years before the an election year. Oh, you know what? No, I I know I know something. I am actually a little bit nostalgic for now is uh, alternative worship music. Oh yeah, you were showing me some of that. Yeah, day. so I remember. Um, so 2013, 2012. Through 2015. And this was like grassroots stuff for what we know today, kind of. Is uh, kind of like the years where I transitioned out of being a metalhead. And yeah. so um, I cut, was... come to Jesus moment as a metalhead. Well, I mean, I was, I was following <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, you were following Jesus the whole time. The whole time. Yeah. But um, I was never into Christian music, worship music. Mm, mm. Um, even though I had grown up like playing and singing in church... Like I still wasn't into the music, mm. um, although I, I I do have to say that I am nostalgic for certain hymns. But like oh, as yeah. far as Christian popular music, I was it was not my thing. Um, and so I sort of got out of being a metalhead, started getting into more underground, experimental, indie type music that wasn't metal. And in the process, I discovered this like sort of indie, sort of alternative uh, worship music scene that I didn't know existed. Mm. And I got really into it and then, for a little while, and then I kind of got out of it. But then recently, I like within the past like two months or so, I've been starting to listen to some of those bands a little bit more again. I'm like, oh, man, 
I remember when I discovered this. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I remember discovering Lecrae around that time, and that really did a lot for like uh, spiritual work in my life. But anyway, he. I remember finding the the first Rel, not first, but it was his Rebel album from 08, I believe. And I remember listening to that just a few months ago, and I'm like, whoa, I remember when I started listening to this. It was about that time. I'm like, dude, 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 oh, my God. It's bringing me back, man. Bring me back. <laughs> Bring me so, we're so back, David. So back. <laughs> so back. You know what? There's a movie that I would say that gives me the warm and fuzzy feelings, but I discovered it when I was an adult. Hmm. And it would be the movie, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's uh, directed by Joel Schumacher. Good old Joel Schumacher, you know? Oh, yes. He uh, did many a movie, and one of those films includes St. Elmo's Fire, if you've ever seen that movie. I, I've i heard of that movie, but... It's got the, the, the 80s Brat Pack in it. Yeah, yeah. I've never... It's not one that I've ever sat down and watched. I remember borrowing it from a friend of mine who I was working with at the time, at my current... At my, my job at the time... And we were working together, and I was like, oh, yeah, I heard it. the song was playing from the movie that they it was actually from the 1984 Olympics, I believe, the song St. Elmo's Fire. And then they actually, I can't remember what year of the Olympics it was. But anyway, they used that song in the movie St. Elmo's Fire as well. So you have this movie. Or anyway, so I asked my friend, I'm like, oh, hey, this is from a movie? And she's like, yeah, it was. You you should watch it. She's like, oh, I have the DVD. I'll let you borrow it. And I remember putting it into my PC. And I sat there one night and I watched it. Good old Dr. Pepper by my side. And I remember watching it. And it was it's very much so at this point in my life, you know, I was working, I was doing going doing a bunch of jobs, just got done with college. And this film is like people who from like college doing the same thing. And so it's very much a film. That's very much meant for people my age, 100%. And it was in the 80s. And it was a very delightfully enjoyable film with some like dark elements and the, 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 the negative aspects of friend groups and the negative aspects of figuring your life out, getting your esh together, you know. And it was very poignant in that part of my life. And I remember watching it that night and it was felt so warm and... It was. It just felt like a warm blanket in a lot of ways, but also like it was enticing. It was like, where has this movie been all my life? But it's weird how certain media, no matter how old it is, it meets you at just the right moment of your life, whatever season you may be in. And you know what? I think, I think that's part of why we talk about art so much and why it's so important is because there's so much value you can extract from it. And what I mean by that, David, is that you never, ever know who's going to be watching it, what part of the life they're in, what situation they're a part of. If they're a husband, if they're a wife, if they're a little kid, if they're an older brother or sister, if they're a younger brother or sister, if they're a grandfather who's like, you know what? I don't got much time here, but Oh, it's this old movie that comes on TV. What's what's Big Jake all about? You know, that John Wayne film. And then he watches it and he's like, holy shit. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. And then he's got a new new meaning in his life. But anyway, I think it's important. The reason why we talk about, I think, art so much and the importance of media and the intentionality of it, in all in all, you never know who's going to be looking up to you. You never know who's going to be inspired by such art. And that's why when you're creating it, you really got to hammer down and know your intentions, whether it be intentions of making it and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I'm getting the semantics. I want to know what you think about the emotional response people have to certain things when they're in, in their different parts of their lives and what that concept means to you. Mm. Talking about nostalgia, but not necessarily what you've been nostalgic for in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a new experience. Yeah, some the the human brain is an interesting thing, um, and it's just people form 
people have the it's it's called um what is it called? What's that word? What's that word? Um Reb- Reb- brought to you by the letter G. <laughs> Catharsis. <laughs> Sorry, letter C. <laughs> That's the word I was looking for. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I see, I see. Um sometimes as um uh, as humans, we have a need for our emotions to be purged. Ooh. And that's essentially what catharsis is, is a purging or a cleansing of built up deep seated emotions. And what's very interesting is art and media can often serve as a catalyst for those cathartic moments. Mm. It can be very, very, very powerful. Um, and what's interesting too is the way the human brain forms associations something can be cathartic for a person um, in a way that completely defies or upends the original intentions of the artist or creator themselves. Mm. And, and, and I think it's important to point out that not everybody's going to have the same reaction to certain forms of media. I've, I'd rather think that St. Elmo's Fire is a rather cheesy film. It's all said and done. I mean, especially if you're like, especially if you're not part of that Adrian's are kind of going yeah. for. But I will say that there's other things to appreciate about the media and that people get through it, but there's a certain specialness to when things hit you at a certain time, it, be it catharsis. And whether it be like, oh, wow, this is exactly what I've been going through. Oh, this worship song is like really just what God, seems to be what God wants me to know right now for example, or it's something like, oh my God, I remember seeing this game when I was little, this video game, and now I finally get a chance to play it and I'm all grown up, but I finally get the chance. Mm -hmm. Uh, My sister and me played a a Wallace and Gromit game on the original Xbox. (laughs) And we were like, (laughs) which they released two of them and we were playing one of them and we're like, it was a were rabbit one, I believe. And we were playing it together co-op and we were both looking at each other and we said, Dude, if the, if we got this when we were little, this would be one of our favorite games of all time. Like we're already a fan of it, Walls and Gromit, and we're already a fan of this game. We're playing it, and we're enjoying it very, very much. It's a good co-op game. But we were playing it, and we're like, dude, we would eat this up when we were little. Like this would be one of our favorite games of all time. And be it so, we played it when we were adults. So it's funny how you find things from your childhood and you find things later on that is in your era, in qu- your era, in quotes, and you're like, whoa, man, this is like, this was made for me, you know? <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see older YouTube. I think a lot of people, especially with older YouTube, are becoming nostalgia for it um, with the, uh, what's it called? Um, the lack of censorship and all these kind yeah. of things they want from that era back. Back when it was uh, the wild, wild the west. The wild, wild west of the internet, man. Yeah, what's interesting is YouTube is coming up on its 20th birthday. That's right. It was 05, wasn't it? Dang. Yeah, there's um, there's quite a few creators I've been following and I've discovered later on and I, I found out they were actually early, early, early on in YouTube. I think of people like Blimey Cow, I think of people like the Hodge twins. I think of people like um, many, many, many endless examples. But it's cool because like, I feel like nostalgia can also be a trap, David. I feel like the Wii U situation is a great example of that. It's like, uh, like, we have it so good now with the Nintendo Switch, David. Oh, yeah. A Nintendo console that actually has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and a shop that actually, most of the time, works? What? And Nintendo's on, like, their A game? And a, What? An actual library of quality games? A library of exceptional games? <laughs> what? Two banger open world Zelda games? I would have peed my pants back in the day if this thing was, like, if I knew this existed, you know? And I think people who look back fondly, who are definitely were kids back then, don't know what they're talking about. Let's be real. Yeah, that's the thing. Nostalgia can be a trap sometimes. Because mm. um, 
I'm a little nostalgic for Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Awful Ooh. movie. <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible movie. Uh-huh. Um, that just... Pod, the, the, the pod raising. Just... It sucks! Utter, <laughs> it's utter garbage. <laughs> but I'm nostalgic for it because I was... Mm. Grew up yeah. being a fan of Star Wars. And mm. so I remember being a little kid in the 90s being like, man, I just want more Star Wars movies. And then 1999 rolls around. Well, it was before that because it was a few years prior to that because I was like, I heard the the rumblings. Oh yeah, man. The distant omens of new <laughs> Star Wars coming down the, <laughs> the pipeline. Hype was I was so excited. Big. I was excited. And then 1999 rolls around. I see the Phantom Menace. And honestly, I don't even remember my impressions of the film other than the fact that it was new Star Wars and I was excited for it. And so <laughs> when I watched Phantom Menace as an adult, I kind of had this, this sort of rose colored glasses towards it. You know, it was like the duel of the fates and all mm. Darth Maul and Ooh. all this cool Ooh. stuff. Mm. And, you know, and it's, but I also have the self awareness that Phantom Menace is not a great film. In no. fact, it's, no. it's pretty, it's pretty abysmal. It's not a great film at all. Um, but it's entertaining at least. But I bring that up because you, you said that it can be a trap. Mm. And I think it's a trap. I think Star Wars is a great example of that because mm. you, ha mm -hmm. Star Wars has such a tumultuous history. Mm. You have the original trilogy, then you have the prequel trilogy, mm. which was George Lucas, but in full creative <laughs> control, Un unfiltered force, man. Literally, N literally nobody said no to him during this era, yep. which George Lucas has a lot of terrible ideas that needed to be said no to. <laughs> And then he uh. sells the franchise to Disney. They come out with a sequel trilogy, and each one is each one is bad in its own special way. Yes, it's like a very special. It's way. like a panoply of bad. <laughs> you know, you have you have the um, the Force Awakens. This is going to sound terrible, but it sounds like a oh, man. I'm not going to say it. Never mind. You have you have the Force Awakens, which is like. Like a shameless reboot. I was going to bring that of, up actually when we were talking about Ghostbusters. It's the exact same scenario. Yeah, yeah. It's a shameless reboot of A New Hope mm -hmm. to the point where they wrangle the story. Yep. They like, mm -hmm. they wrangle the story and characters mm -hmm. into these places um, where they... Kind of haphazardly in a lot of ways. Yeah, where so they end up, so all the characters end up in the same place they were. In the beginning. In the beginning. Yeah. So now Leia's the leader well, of an insurgent yeah, rebellion. Yeah. I'm not here to debate Force Awakens. Um, <laughs> Han Solo is a, is a smuggler and a criminal. Yep. Uh, yep. Luke is on some backwater planet. <laughs> and and Ray is still wandering, wandering. Yeah. So, and they, they do that. They don't even show it happening. They just, you have the opening text crawl. And it's like, by the way, all the development stuff... That you yeah. that happened in Return of the Jedi. It's all been reset. It's all been reset like, just what? due to this, you know, magical plot device so of the opening text dumb. crawl. Um, so yeah, that except for Luke, because we're not going to bring that till the second one. Yeah, yeah. And then you got that. Then you got the Last Jedi, which is just like some dude is like, <laughs> I, wonder I wonder if I just like shit on Star Wars. <laughs> Just like <coughs> pulled my pants down and took a giant fat dump on and it. And I'm going to make it a very lore accurate as much as I can, <laughs> but it's still going to be piece of S-H-I-T, you know? And then you have, uh, then you and have, then you have Rise of Skywalker, Rise of Skywalker, which I think was, um, Man. uh, what's his face? Uh, JJ, baby. JJ Abram baby. trying, desperately trying to salvage the, the, the last pieces. remnants of the last Star Wars. Jedis, man. <laughs> Desperately trying. Re and because regard I'm not gonna get I'm I'm not gonna get into it. Sorry. No. But I, I will say, if you like or hate Last Jedi, regardless if you like or hate it, it left the story, the characters, everything, the in direction a, in a broken in a pile broken of pile of what the heck is next. Yeah. So what the heck? Like, 
I think this is my co- like my epiphany with the people who say Last Jedi is terrible because I still think there's some redeeming qualities to that film. I remember going to the theaters and then finding out later people's reactions about it. I'm like, what? What? Because I kind of liked that movie, but I also kind of like Rise of Skywalker when I got done with it. But I kind of knew in my heart this is not good. So I think the ending is poignant and th- something I don't hear people talk about, David. It's the ending of the Last Jedi, and it's it completely breaks apart the direction of the whole trilogy and it leaves a mess for the next person. Mm-hmm. And they definitely weren't going to have Ryan Johnson do the third one. Cause they had Colin Trevorrow and then that guy all got scrapped because of last year's reception and the direction Colin wanted to go because he had some pretty great ideas when you look at the concepts. But as we all know, great ideas are not good unless they are executed correctly. Yeah. So you get JJ back in here and he's like, Oh my God, I have a year and a half. Oh. To fix this, this movie comes out in the end of 2019. What the heck? So I just feel bad for everybody in the situation. But yeah, so, except for even Ryan Johnson. So that so you have in there, in a nutshell, the sort of tumultuous history. Yeah. Of the Star Wars films, tumultuous. And what I find so very interesting mm. is the nostalgia trap. Yep. People yep. Mm-hmm. are. People who were kids yep. when the prequels came out yep. or were, say, young adults mm-hmm. um, with, you know, severely malformed prefrontal cortexes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I had to say it. I had to say it. <laughs> say it one more time. I need to hear it again. <laughs> you mean you want to hear? I want to hear that phrase about you these, just said again. About the young adults with their severely malformed <laughs> prefrontal cortexes. <laughs> it's the, the soy jack meme. That's what uh, you're describing. Yeah. Oh my god. Um so Wow. Because that was a joke I was gonna make earlier. Oh, oh never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, let's move on. Yeah, so you, have, so you have these people <coughs> looking at the mess of the Star Wars sequel trilogy and being like, man, don't you remember when Star Wars was good? Oh, I God. remember the prequel trilogy. Man, Star Wars was good. It was good, man. Bring man. back Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> well, they don't say that. They don't but. say that, but they say, God, Obi-Wan was so great. Oh, as, and that's that's as far as I remember. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, that was like the only redeeming quality mm. out of the entire prequel trilogy, I think, was Ewan McGregor. He, yep. he, he, except for Phantom Menace. Phantom Menace, he was oh, annoying. Really? He was oh. annoying AF. He was just like a, <laughs> he was just like a bored stick in the mud that doesn't <laughs> do anything. The entire movie, like literally the entire movie is him watching Qui-Gon's <laughs> adventures from afar and complaining about them. And at the end of the movie, he's about to be killed and then magically is able to defeat um, um, Darth Maul. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So aside from that no, movie, but in the, yeah. in the, in two and three, in two and three which are terrible movies as mm. well in their own right. Yeah, yeah. But his performance in those movies is like pretty much, I would say, the redeeming quality. If you're going to mm-hmm. watch two and three for anything, it's Ian watch McGregor. them for, yeah, you and McGregor. Especially Revenge of the Sith, but I'm not going to get into it. Dude. Revenge love, of the love. Sith is interesting, too, because mm. you and McGregor is still entertaining in that movie, despite the awful dialogue. Yeah, he's The writing he really... in that movie was like bottom of the barrel, mm-hmm. and somehow you and McGregor still managed to deliver those lines with some sense of convincing emotion it's incredible yeah yeah especially in the last battle the final battle of what's it called the the battle of heroes yeah when uh hayden christensen is like when they're you turned her (laughs) against me like and and like you and mcgregor is somehow able to keep it together and actually deliver the lines in a convincing way he does a really good job compared to his counterpart but (laughs) yeah so but I think the nostalgia trap, what you brought up, is exactly what I wanted to say. Because people are saying, oh, man, the prequels were so good, man. This Disney crap is so bad. And it's like, guys, listen to me. At this point, in 10 years, in 20 years, 
we're going to get people who say that The Last Jedi was a masterpiece. No, oh, yeah. That's what's going to happen. It's inevitable. People are going to say, man, Force Awakens set it up really well, and Ryan Johnson just molded into his own thing, and it was amazing. And then they're going to say that, and Rise of Skywalker, eh, it was a misstep. It didn't end that well. But it had some real, oh, the fight with Ray and Palp. Oh, man. Like, they're going to, I'm swear, dude, it's going to happen. People, are, I remember when Ryan, Last Jedi came out, I'm like, Either pe people are going to come back to this film and think it's a masterpiece, whether they be correct or incorrect, which I think they'll probably be incorrect about it. But anyway, it's a trap, man. And it made me ex analyze. When last year I came out, it made me analyze the original trilogy of what made it so good. And then that, you know, as we all know, we know why they're so good. We already know why they're so good. And it's just an amalgamation of everything about those films that made them good. Editing, acting, the redirections from Lucas or from away from Lucas. <laughs> There's so many reasons why, but we won't dive into them here. But it's a trap. It's a trap. I think of, oh shoot, what was the thing I was going to bring up? It was um, it was the thing with Star Wars. Oh, Obi-Wan, the show, Obi-Wan that came out. I remember being pretty hyped for that series. Six episodes, we're going to Ian McGregor back, and Hayden Christensen's coming back as, really? Okay. And I'd actually... Hayden Christensen and Obi-Wan together were the best part of that series, hands down. It was pretty great. However, it was a very poorly, poorly paced and abysmal direction of that series. And I hate to say that because I do like the lady who directed it. I think she did a good job on The Mandalorian and some of the episodes she did. I think Ian McGregor's fantastic. But there's just not much substance there. And it left me disappointed and longing for more. Yeah, um, you that could tell show. it was a two-hour and something movie that was split up into six episodes. Ooh. it was sad. Oh boy, very sad. Um, that movie so sad, incredibly sad. One of the saddest things I've ever seen in my life. That show, I never watched it from, but from all the reviews mm. and stuff I hear of it, it seemed like that show was an intentional nostalgia trap. Mm. It seems like they try it like you and McGregor's Obi Wan was the bait. That was gonna draw everyone in. So and the hype, like Kathleen Kennedy hype, yeah, yeah. Ian McGregor coming up on stage. Yeah, like so. Basically, it was like the bait to draw people in to watch this giant piece of crap that yeah. they would not have otherwise. It's so unfortunate, so unfortunate. But I think it's also interesting how it is utilized as a weapon. Nostalgia is, especially as we know with Star Wars today. But I even would say, like, even the Marvel movies that have been coming out, they're very much trying to... They don't know what they're doing. No. Not right now. But it seems like it's on the up and up. But I think what it all lacks is a clear sense of direction because nostalgia has been utilized so well in so many good in so many things, David. Even with the MCU being kind of garbo today, you think of Infinity War and Endgame. They did every single thing they could to make it right with the last 10 or so years of the history of those films, the 20 something films they had to reference and to bring to a conclusion. And they did it, in my opinion, spectacularly. Yes, there's lots of fan service. And I'm talking about the good fan service, not the weird anime stuff. The good fan service <laughs> where you're like, like an end game. Like, I'm not gonna say what's an end game, but you like, everybody knows it. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Like, the moments, the callbacks, the parts of, of pure catharsis. And you're like, whoa, this is like, and it's turned up to 11 and you're like, oh my God. And this is how probably people felt when the comics finally came out and those endings and those stories and those characters, you were paying off and they just handled it really well and translated it into a movie form. I feel like they could have done even more if they wanted to, but the point of it is like it can be utilized really well. And I think a good example of that, David, I know you haven't seen it and it's not the best show in the world. And it has no right to be as good as it is. But I would say Cobra Kai is actually one of those examples. Mm, so, I uh, actually watched the first episode of oh, that. Oh, you did? Okay. So it's not a great show. It's not like Shakespeare or anything. <laughs> but the way these characters are written and the situations they are put in and the way they have to handle them and the call and the and the taste, the tastefulness is the word I want to use. The tasteful callbacks to the original karate kid films are very well done. Sometimes in the later seasons are a little heavy handed, but they're really, really um, 
tastefully handled. Mm. You think of, um, and, and in season one, it's a little weird because it's like, okay, wait, you have Johnny with his champion, but his son is now Danielson's champion. Okay, wait, what's going on? This is kind of weird and a little like, it feels like fan fiction, right? But the thing with it is, is it's done in such a tasteful way, David, I would argue, even though it's not Shakespeare, it's done in a very respectful manner that it keeps it engaging and they make right choices along the way okay. with good callbacks to the original Karate Kid films. And as you get into the later seasons, and, you, and Karate Kid 3 is a terrible movie. It's not good at all. I don't know what the heck they were thinking. Um, but even when they're calling back to the third film in the later seasons and the second film, the second film is probably the most tastefully handled out of them all, especially in later seasons. But even the third one, where they bring back some characters, and you're like, huh, what? Now the real question is, did yes. they make any callbacks to the next Karate Kid? That's what I'm curious about, because I never finished season five, which is crazy, it has five seasons, and they're going to end it with six this year. And then there's a movie, David. Did you hear about this? There's a movie coming out called, uh, it's a Karate Kid film, called The Karate Kid. It has Danielson in it. It has Ralph Macchio, as well as Jackie Chan. Oh. Who was in who the was Karate, in the Kid, Karate reboot. Kid reboot? Yeah, yeah. So you have him and Danielson in this next film, teaching some kid. I don't know what it's going to be about, but you have season six coming up, and I'm like, are they going to get? Is it Sissy? Not Sissy Spacek. Uh, Hillary Swank. Hillary Swank. Are they going to bring Hillary Swank back? Are they? Have they already done that in season five? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So I think. There are examples out there of tastefulness and nostalgia. I would say even the DuckTales series, the rebooted one with uh, David Tennant as Scrooge McDuck. Oh, that's I've never heard of that. It's um, It was on Disney Channel for a few years, and they went for, I think, three seasons. But it was I, I wasn't a huge fan of it because I like the older ones, preferably. But I was watching some of it, and I saw you know my sisters dive into, like, deep dive into it. And they got into, like, the Scrooge McDuck lore and the family stuff, which is really um. interesting. <laughs> well, like if you read like the Scrooge McDuck comics, there's a lot there, mm. and especially like how he rose to fame and, and, and power, you know. But anyway, I think that was tastefully done. It was fans of the film that could have handled it really badly. Mm. It could have been really bad fan fiction, but no, they took it in its own direction, its own original story with um, lots of characters we all knew, and but with characters we knew, but they kept it in a respectful manner. And I think it's funny how that's a Disney property. It was handled with tastefulness versus something like Star Wars, you know? Yeah. And unfortunately. Callbacks too, like nostalgic callbacks in modern films is something I kind of want to bring up because it seems mm. like that sort of become the default thing for like, uh, especially for comedies. Ooh. Um, like, They'll they'll do little jokes, little callbacks, little references to something that the audience will be is familiar with. Um, and the problem is, is sometimes that's all that they do. Mm. Like a good example of that would be the the Coming to America sequel. Oh my gosh! Like the they brought back the entire the literal entire cast. Of the first movie, minus Samuel L. Jackson, which was like... Because Samuel, <laughs> Samuel Jackson was smart. He's like, no, I, even if they did ask me back, I'm not doing it. <laughs> he's going to be like a correctional officer if they did come back. You know, he's not a thug anymore. He's like a cop or something. That'd be funny. Uh, yeah. So they brought back the entire cast, minus him. And then the entire script, every joke in the entire script, was nothing but callbacks to the first movie. Mm. It was like re all the beat same beats, um, the comedic timing, everything from the first movie. They just called back to it, referenced back to it again and again and again and again and again. And it's like I feel like that's the trap that modern movies and shows fall into. Is you know most of the time. Things that come out are based on previously existing properties anyway. There's very few like new things that come out nowadays 
And then, so you have the vast majority of things that are based on existing properties, and the properties that they're based on have so much, Mm. so many films, movies, books, comic books, video games, whatever. There's just an entire library of media that are attached to these franchises, and it just seems like the thing to do nowadays is just to try and get your audience excited for your new thing by calling back to something in a previous entry in the franchise that they were excited for. That can be good when it's well done, and it can be good when it's done sparingly alongside Mm. fresh original ideas. Yes, that's you nailed it on the head, by the way. That's the key is sparingly. That's why probably I like Cobra Kai so much because it doesn't do it all the time. These are brand new characters with brand new kids and kids that actually aren't bad actors at all. They're pretty actually all right. Um, as well as different characters that are brought in. Like there's a middle aged guy that comes in to like the karate dojo at one point in the series. And he's like this like man child who's like 30 or something. And he's like, I'm going to take karate and I'm going to be cool. And like some of the teens have like a house party they all go to and he shows up with like his new beard, like his goatee, like braided into a little, a little braid. And he's called, he names himself Stingray. (laughs) He's trying to be cool and hip with the kids, but like it shows like he learns a lesson. They do some interesting things with him. He's supposed to be the comedic relief, but also there's some more things on the side that you find out about him and situations he gets himself into that makes his character more appealing as you go along. Because first you're like, oh, God, why did they write this guy in here? And then you realize they're like, oh, this actually is pretty well done, you know. But So there's original stuff. And then sparingly throughout, you have the callbacks to Miyagi, the callbacks to all this stuff. So anyway, sparingly is the word, David. Sparingly. I'm interested to see. You know what another great example is? I don't know if you ever played it. I just recently beat it again. It was the reboot of uh, Doom. From 2016, the game. So id Tech Software, right? Made Doom in the back of the day. All these other games. Had a real big falling out after John Carmack left. Or even latter half when he was there. And this studio kind of lost its identity in a lot of ways. Still had a lot of people working there from back in the day. And then come 2016, they release this reboot of Doom. Starring Alex Jones, of course. (laughs) Yeah, if you want to look up the funny... Alex Jones Doom thing. It's really funny on YouTube. Anyway, this game comes out and it is glowing praise from lots of people. Rip and tear, demons apart, all this wonderful, like, wonderful, all these um, <laughs> engaging, this engaging gameplay, the glory kill system. They have new things in there. You have uh, lots of callbacks, but it's its own modern take and it's its own shooter and it's awesome. And it's great, and it does a great job of being a good game, but also calling back to stuff. Like, you'll find little codexes in the game, little Funko Pops of little demons and stuff you'll collect, and it'll tell history about the game and the franchise. But it takes a lot of direction to make things, uh, to correctly call back to what you've come before and respect What's come before? I don't think, for example, 2016 Ghostbusters or Rise of Skywalker are great examples of respecting the source material or what's come before. It's um, taking it and using it to your own uh, volition and molding it into what you want it to be with bad intentions. And I think with something like Doom, for example, it had a pretty strenuous development cycle. This game was in development for like five, six years. In 20, I think it was 09 when they started making it and through the years through 2012, 13, 14, 15, they were really struggling or with 20, I think 2014, they had to reboot it. They really struggled with the direction. And then they had some younger designers and creative directors come in who loved the original stuff. And they were like, Oh my God, I get to work here. This is awesome. They're like, okay, what do we need to do? What do we need to go through? And if you watch the documentary they made by no clip about this game, Doom 2016, the guy is heavily like influenced, inspired by you know 80s movies and he's 80s action. And so he's like, okay, well, I'm gonna take that and kind of use that as my inspiration for this game. So the very the whole intro of the game is very much uh, not a callback, but very heavily influenced by the opening of RoboCop, 
where there's this guy and he's powerful, he's being operated on, all this stuff. And he took inspiration from that. And it's cool to see because he took inspiration from it, but he made it his own thing. And he made it into its own new identity while keeping the history here. So I think that's just a prime example of taking something that was beloved back in the day, in quotes, and bringing it with new, your own twist on it, with inspirations that you've learned along the way and having that direction. And then you can sparingly use the callbacks. Also, it was a dang good game. So <laughs> that kind of helps. Winning wins everything. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sad for Star Wars, David. I'm so, so, so sad. So sad for Star Wars. Hideo Kojima. No, I was not going to say that. <laughs> you know, yeah, it really is kind of a sad thing because I think, honestly, I think it's time to put Star Wars to rest. Time to take it out back. Time to take it out back and shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, well, I mean. There's no love. Well, I, yeah, I, it's, it's hard been, to say because the people who are running the show who are leading the the front for Star Wars don't really love it. No. I mean, for what it is. I I think Dave Filoni loves it. I think John Favreau loves it. But I Some feel like people love it. I feel like that's about it. Yeah. And I feel like they have to do so many things to make the higher ups happy. Yeah. To make the corporate people, you know, happy. And it's just so sad. Like I mean, they're not going to get rid of Kathleen Kennedy because she's a woman. That's going to look really bad for them. Yeah. It's the same situation uh, with the Halo franchise. They didn't want to get rid of, uh, I think it's Connie Booth. They didn't want to get rid of Connie Booth because she was leading it for like 10 years and they didn't want to get rid of her. They finally were able to, but her whole leadership team left and they left a mess in Halo Infinite and the direction and everything. So bad that in a year or two before the game came out, they brought Joe Staten in and they're like, yo, bro, you made and wrote Halo 2. Help us fix this. And he's like, how the heck do I fix this? And he was able to do a pretty all right job, but he then left. And it's like, it's part of management. It's part of direction. It's the lack of creative love, the love for your creation or the creation of other people. Yeah, most the franchise exists really to serve corporate interests more than anything else nowadays mm. they you know i we talk about it's time to take it out back and shoot it it's already been shot it's and they, dead <laughs> it's dead and his corpse has been mangled and they're parade still parading around for everyone to see mm. it's like um what's that movie where they where they um what's that movie where they uh uh, parade the dead guy around. Oh, weekend at Bernie's. Weekend at Bernie's. Yeah, it's like weekend at Bernie's, except instead of except the there's no deception. It's just like the corpse is rotting and mangled, and they're still <laughs> parading it around, <laughs> acting like they're uh, you know fooling people. Yeah, it's. I hope whatever they got cooking in the background, whether it be the Mandalorian movie that's going to come out in the next couple of years or Jane. Jo- supposedly James Mangold's whole trilogy he's going to make about the pre old Republic stuff. Well, we'll have to see. I, I watched Ahsoka David. I didn't finish it. There was a lot of really great elements in that show, but it suffers from Filoni's pacing because he's used to animation. And it's unfortunate that he doesn't make it as engaging as it can be for star Wars and also fails to tell an engaging story about it. Like the best part of that show was nostalgia that they brought in at one point. And it was like, Whoa, I am, I am in. And then it's like, Oh, okay. Well, I'm not really in for the cool new stuff that they're trying to do. So it's just disappointing to say the very least. And I'm kind of sad. Let's, let's move away from star Wars. Too. Let's move <laughs> away from it. The games though. I'm excited about you got Jedi Fallen Order and Survivor that came out. I heard were, I heard Survivor was great. I love Fallen Order. You have Outlaws, which is coming out, which is about a bounty hunter and working for the syndicates and all that during the Empire. Mm. And I think Respawn is working on a shooter of some kind. Hopefully. We'll see. But let's move on from Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's talk about um, 
something that you do feel kind of nostalgic about. I saw you were playing that game, Eternal Sonata. Oh yeah, Eternal Sonata. And that's kind of a nostalgic kind of thing for you. What is that, and what? How have you come into possession of this? So Eternal Sonata is a JRPG from Xbox 360. Yeah, I don't even remember what year it was released. Yeah, I have the cover right here. Let me see what we got here. It was 2007. Yeah, so I remember uh, way back in the day, mm. I was uh, a subscriber to Electronic Gaming Monthly. Oh, yeah. A uh, physical magazine subscription for all those Gen Zers out there who don't know what <laughs> such things are. Buy some magazine, yeah. Um, but yeah, it the EGM used to come with uh, demo discs, and um, I would uh, one in particular uh, came with a demo of Eternal Sonata, and I, I I played that demo like twenty times. Mm. Um, I was into it, just the the music, the art style, the combat. It lacks depth, but it's still entertaining. It's cool. It's got its own kind of vibe to how it does things. Yeah. Um. So, but then, how long have you played it for now? Like, do you know? Uh, for now, now, yeah, now? like how long? Like how much time have you put into it? Um, probably like three or four hours so oh, far. Nice, nice. Um. Do you yeah. know how long it is? Because it was more of a short. It's, yeah, a it's a short game. I think it's only like seven or eight hours long. Oh dang! Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um. So yeah, I play the demo a lot and then I just kind of like forgot about it basically and then I sort of fell off the gaming bandwagon for a while um and uh then fast flash forward to you know god what is it like like 14 15 years later now something like that yeah I can't even what's the 08 2004 17 years would that be right? No, wait. 16 That'd be years? 04. That'd be 04. So like 16, 15 years. Yeah. 16 years, yeah. So yeah, like yeah. fast forward to 16 years later. Um, yeah, you, I had just mentioned in passing to you, I think. And then you're like, oh, I have that game. And I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I've, uh, I've been, I've been actually playing it and uh, it's, it's not a uh, what you would call a stone cold classic by any means, but it's entertaining. I I have enjoyed my playthrough of it so far. I remember um, doing research on a bunch of different Xbox 360, by the way, JRPG, and I remember it was yeah 2021. I bought this. I found it in GameStop. I was perusing around, and oh no, 2020. Wow. So I found it randomly. This has a Blue Dragon advertisement in the back. Um, but I remember randomly finding it at GameStop, somebody training in a bunch of old 360 games. And this disc was in pretty good condition. I was very surprised. And so there's a lot of great JRPGs on there. And I think it's cool that I'm always into gaming history and preserving it and that kind of thing. And in fact, did you know, David, speaking of magazines, Game Informer is coming back with their physical subscription of magazines. Are you serious? I am serious. So they... um they did a mass firing about two years ago. They have a new guy there uh, who I've been following since he started like YouTube, uh, probably 2017. But anyway, he's their videographer now, and he's been a huge creative force behind their YouTube channel, their magazine stuff. They have only a few more writers left, and a lot of the veterans have left except for, except for say, one. And they are bringing back up their video game subscription magazines. They are owned by GameStop still. And the whole company and that kind of thing. So hopefully they stick around. I love Game Informer so much. But they came back and they said, hey, for $19.91, you can get a year subscription for the magazine. And the reason why it's nineteen ninety one is because that was the year they were really... They, they, <laughs> <laughs> that was, they did it. They went there. <laughs> so yeah. So for $19.91, you can get a year subscription for Game Informer. I'm not, we're not sponsored by them, by the way. I'm just, I'm just saying it because I love but, them. But... But, I mean, come on, Game Informer, 30, talk to us for thirty-five. Yeah, exactly. GameStop, <laughs> give me that Game Stank money, you know, uh, them stonks. You know, all the money you're getting from them stonks right now on the the, the the Wall Street. But 
Uh, you can also get a sec- two-year subscription for 35 So I bought that. I bought the two-year subscription. So hopefully mine will come at some point. I don't know. But that, that's, that's cool. interesting. I it's cool. I haven't read a magazine in years. Mm, yeah. So... There's also there's also a, a Kickstarter I've I've been a part of called Oh jeez I am I apologize the guy's name Sandeep Rye and he, what he does is on the weekends he writes and develops a retro PlayStation magazine mm. and he he's in the UK and he does it all in house at home and he makes a very nice quality about yay big PlayStation magazine released quarterly and he has it he's on Kickstarter. And so for like 15 bucks or whatever, you can get it. And so I've been doing that the last six or seven months right now. And very lovely, high quality print little magazines you get that are about, I'd say probably eight and a half by, uh, probably like six by 10 inches, something like that. They're small, but they're very well put together, well written. and, And it's cool to have the physical media. The physicalness of it all. I love it, David. I was going to a doctor appointment the other day. Instead of taking my Steam Deck or whatever, I'm like, I'm going to take these PlayStation magazines and read through them. And it was cool. Like, even stuff I'm not interested to do in, in like Gran Turismo. It's like, it's what's in the magazine. So I'm like, I guess I'll read about it. So I read on the history of Gran Turismo and it was a good time. Yeah, physical media is like, it's weird how, um, it's weird how physical media has become such a almost like a special thing yeah to those who can appreciate it it's like mm. a it's a very special thing in a way that it wasn't before i mean i i grew up in the in the era of tapes and cds mm. you know and so it's like his tapes and cds were just like whatever you know um back in the day but now but nowadays it's like and i didn't grow up in the vinyl era but nowadays um when a, there's a really special album mm. that I like by an artist, um, I usually end up buying it on on vinyl um, because just I like I like having the physical media, and I think as far as music goes, I think vinyl represents the idea of physical music media better than any other format. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's just very special thing to take the disc out of the sleeve put it down, get the needle in place, listen to it, and then flip it over halfway through. It just, it, there's almost like a it's sort of... It's an experience. Of, yeah, there's like a sort of a ritual nature to mm. it that kind of grounds what you're listening to and turns it into a tangible thing. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, I love Spotify. I love, it's like one of my favorite things in the world, for sure. But vinyl for example, is it's the embodiment of where it originally came from. And it's, it's better in a lot of ways. The quality of music, for example, the warmness of it and all that, and all that fancy stuff. I'm not into vinyl, as you can probably tell, but the warmth, the bass, the mids, the treble, the bass, you know? Oh yeah. That that's mids, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, that part of the Fallout show, we just got done watching the Fallout season one on Amazon. And that part, I was like, it's just, I've been in I've been that guy in so many conversations. I'm like, oh, this is the mids, right? <laughs> it's like, and they're like, yeah, and he's like, yeah, it feels really, you know, a lot of people don't really get music, you know. <laughs> I love it. But anyway. I remember reading something where a guy was like, hey, we pulled out a bunch of old CDs from like uh, 97 or 98 or whatever. And he was like, we put it in a CD player and dude, the quality, the quality of the sound is really good. It's better than streaming. It definitely is. I like if you take MP like a disc CD or even a ripped MP3, it's going to sound way better than anything you hear on streaming. Like maybe say minus Apple because Apple does some really good high quality streaming in their video and audio, which well, is Apple just uses second a to um, second to none. Apple uses a uh, lossless format. Yeah, they use lossless format. Yeah, so that, that great. plays a big role Sounds in the wonderful. quality of it. Sounds wonderful, and it's cool that you can stream that because that's those are some big audio files in turn. Not not people, but those are some <laughs> big files of audio that that you got to stream and. The, and it's cool that Apple gives that option, but they're the only ones. Um, 
there's another YouTuber I follow. I can't remember his name for the for the sake of him for the sake of me, but uh, unfortunately, but he talks about going more analog, buying an MP3 player, getting a dumb phone. I've been getting recommended more of these videos where people are like, from that guy watching that guy, and he's more he's very much a hippie. So just be aware. <laughs> but he's big on really focuses on kind of taking away from the digital the the over the consumption of oneself of the noise as we've been establishing on Snarpfangle where the social media aspect the the internet of it all and really kind of disconnecting you know yeah you know we 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 unplugged the cable when when cable and satellite from satellite tv and went to streaming right but now there's more of a push that people are starting to recognize, especially, um, uh, and it's always been this way outside of America, but even in America now, you're getting people who are like, I kind of like my CDs. I kind of like my Blu-rays. I kind of like my vinyls. And I really kind of want something to own in digital ownership. And we've, we've talked about this a lot on the show, but I think it's important to bring up because it's like, do you want to give control of your access to somebody else and they control your access? Or do you want to actually be in control of the things you consume and as well be more intentional with it? Because it's a lot easy to just boot up YouTube when, when, when boot up YouTube on you, like say your Xbox or PlayStation, instead of going to the shelf, opening up a Blu-ray, plugging it into the console and going from there. And the constant, yeah, this is stuff we talked about before, but the constant getting the constant push of getting rid of physical media too is kind of weird, in my opinion. Yeah, um, what's really interesting is cutting the cable cord was sold as being a liberating experience. Ah, yes, but what I find in the era of streaming is that people are more controlled by the media than they've ever been. Which is weird because when you had all those channels, it was whatever was on those channels, whatever was on the programming in quotes, which you can get into a lot of conspiracy theories with that. But the point of it is it's weird how there's even more control now versus cable. I think that's a good point you bring up. Um, even with the fallout show, like, yeah, it's on Amazon, but you can't go buy it anywhere. You can't go get a download anywhere unless you pirated it. But I think that's interesting because it's taking away access or forms of access away from consumers. And look, it's convenient. I get it. But I think there's more to it than that. There's more, there's more to it than just scrolling on your phone, you know, cause that's the easy thing to do. Like there was a time where there was the other night I wanted to come out here and I wanted to watch Mad Max and I'm like, hey, I don't want to. I'd just rather watch a podcast or something and just chill and vibe or, or play a game and you know dive into Fortnite or whatever. But it's like, no, I'm going to be a man. I'm going to go watch Mad Max in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm glad I did because it turns out I was able to do some stuff around here and, and enjoy it. And I was like, dang, this movie's still really dang good. And so it's that. Which one was it? Uh, it was Fury Road. Oh, okay, okay. I was getting ready for the. Me and Angie actually are going to go see uh, Furiosa today. So ah, yeah, I was getting ready for it. So, whamming, whamming. So, <laughs> I'm very excited for Furiosa. That looks. I've heard great things about it, but yeah, apparently it's not the box office hit. But none of the Mag Max films, I think, were so no. except for the early, early ones. We'll, see. well, I don't know if the I don't know if the early ones well, actually. I, I want to say big the hits. budgets were like. They were very low, and they were able to return on investment. I mean, sure. they definitely made a return on yeah, their return on investment, investment yeah. but I wouldn't call them smash hits yeah. necessarily. Like Fury Road barely broke even, from what I remember. But um, but yeah, the old like um, Mad Max Two and um, Beyond Thunderdome and Beyond Thunderdome, I think, were as as big as the series got, mm. but I wouldn't call them like mega hits. No, 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 for sure. But it's um. It's interesting that the 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 force of Hollywood, for example, like you have people like uh, not Frank Miller. What's the guy's name? Not Mike Miller. Gosh, dang it! What's his name? David. The guy who directed him. Dang it! I've been research. I've been. It's been all over. Dang it! I can't remember his name. The guy who directed Mad Max. Oh, do you I, remember his name? It's not Frank Miller. That's Batman. No, um, no, no, no. Dang it! Um, 
Um, George Miller. There we George go. George Miller. Like, there's still the love that people have for that, and the, especially the executives. And they're like, okay, fine, we'll greenlit this. Here's your budget. You can do it. Finally, it took you, you know, eight more years, but you can make another Mad Max film. But it, there's that love for the ho- for that the that portion of Hollywood has, and the people have for Hollywood of that old analog era, as well as the people who were from the before time of the internet and making good stuff and able to do it still. But you also have the just the over corporatization of it all, trying to push everything in a certain direction. The digital future, as we've we've been established here, and. It's kind of, to me, I don't know, it's kind of what I've been thinking about recently where I'm like, man, what? It's kind of sad, especially with all the streaming services coming into bundles this summer. I think Disney Plus, Hulu, HBO, and I think one more like Peacock or something are all going to be together. Oh, boy. In a bundle for like 35 bucks a month or something like that. And then you have like Apple... Paramount and another one. We're right back to buying different We're cable packages. Right, yeah, and you know what they could do, David, is they could sell you a cable that plugs into your 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 whatever you're watching it from, and that could be your special cable that you buy from Disney to you know to access the to content. access the content. You know, you get a, <laughs> <laughs> each account gets a special code, access to their servers. It, it, it's it's interesting to me, but. I think it's also conflicting with Hollywood because it's like, well, the old way we made money off movies is now gone or it's disappearing, we should say. And they're trying desperately to salvage it, especially from um, those streaming services really building up during the pandemic, which was kind of a bad idea in the, in the long run here. Because now if you're going to put $200 million into a show on Amazon or on Disney plus, how the heck are you going to make investment back on that? We talked about Game Pass on this on this show, where like it just got announced today that the next Call of Duty Black Ops Six, which is it's crazy that there's six of them, is now going to be on Game Pass, which is insane. But I feel like I feel like with that situation, Microsoft is going to do this as a test, see if it works, and they'll probably get a crap load of money, but they're not probably going to get enough because there's no way you can sell the game for seventy bucks per copy. Why would you have people sign up for 15 bucks on Game Pass to get access to it? Yeah, you're going to grow your service, but are people going to stick around? I mean, really, that's essentially what this is, is all the cost that they sink into this stuff only to stick it on a streaming platform or stick it on Game Pass is a way to try and make their money back by attracting new users to the service. Mm. But unfortunately, in most cases, there's there's really a ceiling on how high you can go mm. with that model of business. And even with Netflix, who constantly has probably done it the correct way or have been successful, I should say, in the, net, in the right way. I mean, it took for them forever to be profitable. But even when they're profitable, they make so much original content that it's pretty much mostly garbage that it's like, what are you guys doing? Like, what is your goal of making all this original content? And I think it's a smart move in a sense but it's mostly trash like what like if you're king of trash you're king of trash it's still trash yeah you know <laughs> and, and it's weird because like it, it's it's when you think about it it's like i get why they're doing it they're trying to make original content they've been doing this for years decade plus they're making original content starts with house of cards and they're trying to make quality content to attract more people and stuff that they can own and they don't have to license out and they, they can keep on their service and go from there it gives them more cachet, more investment, that kind of thing. But we're coming to the point where if there's a Netflix movie on Netflix, there's not really a whole lot of hype behind it. Also, they're also not that great in the long run. No. Um, like the, all the great people are going to Apple and uh, HBO and stuff like that. So it's like, it, it makes me wonder like, what the goal of this is. And will Netflix even be around in like 10 to 15 years? Because say there's a big market crash and people divest from Netflix. What do they do then? How are they going to pay for their servers? How are they going to pay for their employees? Um, how are they going to pay for all the constant churn of content, David, from their services? And it's just, uh, it's, it makes me think about the future for sure. So I don't know. Just some, uh, some I've been thinking about Netflix and Disney plus and all these 
HBOs, which it's no longer called HBO, which is weird. Did you know that? Yeah, I did know that. Yeah. Which um, I don't know if this is like conspiracy or confirmed, but my understanding is that they rebranded it so that they didn't have to uh, pay royalties for stuff that was HBO branded. Really? Something like that. Something weird like that. Hmm. Well, um, they own HBO, though. Well, I mean, they so they don't have to pay royalties to the people who wrote oh. and created their HBO hmm. content. I could, I could see that. I could see that. But it, it's we've come to this issue. We come to the conclusion of like Hollywood can't mm. make movie can't make money off their movies the way they used to, and a lot of the it's really hard getting their audiences back in theaters. Yeah, I feel like I think Deadpool three coming out soon will probably do a good get a good chunk of people back in there. Hopefully, but people have been saying that for the last two years. Like, oh, this will be the one. Started with Tenet, you know, the Christopher Nolan movie. <laughs> It'll be the one. And then Barbenheimer happened later on, and you're like, oh, this will be the one. And now it's like, oh, here's the summer movies. This will be the one. I don't know, man. I'm sad because where's Hollywood going to go from here, man? Sad. Unfortunately, the uh, the current system that we we now um, we're now in, I think, is uh a dead model. I think it was a foresight that was very, it was very short sighted when they were looking at it. Very immediate gratification planning, but not like longevity planning, I guess. I think the way of the future is to move away from the rotting, stinking corpse that is Hollywood. I thought you were going to say Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a that's part, another one. Yeah. That's part, part of, of that rotting, stinking corpse <laughs> for sure. Uh, you know what franchise has done a good job of uh, making a call, a good sparing callbacks, David, is uh, the Evil Dead franchise. I mean, and it's been handled with great respect. I would say. I mean, did you see any of Evil Dead Rise that came out last year? No, no, I did not. It, was it good? It was good. It was very, probably the most violent Evil Dead film. I'd say even more violent than the 2013 like remake they did, which was also pretty dang good. I love that movie. Um, but I'm just a fan of Evil Dead, so I love it all. But even though that Rise one came out, it had fresh blood, Sam Raimi produced, it was handled with care. I think of like the even the Hunger Games franchise that came, that that came out past ten plus years ago, but also you have the new one, Songbirds and Snakes. Snakes, like I remember diving back into that world when that movie came out, and I'm like, man, it's really nice to be back in this universe. And then they said, well, what about the next one? They're like, it's up to uh, it's up to dang it, uh, Collins, whatever the author was. It's like it's up to her. Whether we go forward with no one, she's got to write a book first, and then we're going to do it. And we're like, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And then they're like, "Oh, okay, so we might not get another one for like five, six, seven more years." Yeah. But, but it's nice because franchises, I think, need that break because you get the longing. Oh yeah, and I think that's what Star Wars is missing, David. Oh yeah, that's what it's missing. It's missing Absence the longing. Makes the heart grow fonder, yes. as they say. Yes, and in the case of Star Wars. For the heart to grow fonder, we need a major absence. <laughs> yeah, like I'd be cool with them doing like, like just give me a film a year. Don't do the Disney Plus. No stuff. more Star Wars content for ten years. That's what I say. <laughs> I think would be cool is if they keep doing the Disney Plus stuff, but well, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know what the plan would be for them. I think after, like a film every every two, two years. to three two years. to three years would be fine. That yeah. would be, I think, good because they tried to do the film every year, and that really bit them in the butt. Nah, like, in so many ways, it this sucks. Did you watch Solo? Uh, yes, I okay. watched Solo. I liked Solo. Solo was a surprisingly decent, surprisingly movie, decent, yeah. But it oh. suffered mm -hmm. from Last Jedi itis. It did very much so. Last Jedi was like the straw that broke the camel's back, mm. and people were like, "Nope, nope, nope, not going to see this one." And Solo <laughs> did poorly, and it tanked so many the mm. the failure, the box office failure of Solo. Like really tanked a lot of other promising Star Wars projects too. Oh, dude. It was interesting the domino effect. It was so sad, and it was all because the Last Jedi was that moment where people were just like, "Nope, I'm done." 
You know what, David? Be- I think The Last Jedi has done so many different domino fallings. I mean, you look at James Mangold was in development of a Boba Fett movie at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was going to kind of theoretically coincide with the solo film in a way. Maybe look at a younger Boba Fett. Maybe see where, maybe go into more expanding universe kind of stuff. You mm-hmm. know? And then James Mangold didn't end up going with it. And then we got Indy 5. Yeah, I'm sad. <laughs> But, I, I, yeah, you have the Obi-Wan that was going to be a movie. And then they decided to do series. It's like, and it only, it came, dude, Solo came out five months after Ry- uh, Last Jedi. That's freaking crazy. Like, oh, my gosh. But I don't know. I think I'm done talking about nostalgia. <laughs> yeah, let's, um, let's get let's, away from let's get rid of it. Star Wars get, in particular. Get rid of it. It's a rather depressing subject. It's a very depressing subject. How I think, um, David, how are you doing recently? Is there I wanted to kind of bring to you today what David's doing in his life or what's Jake doing in their life recently and Absolutely nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kinda wanna bring up a, a short term goal and a long term goal. Oh, okay, okay. Like what's let's dive into that. So for I can start if you want. How do you okay. want to do it? Go right ahead. I'll, I'll go. I'll go first. Be my guest. Be my guest. I, I'll. I just want to know a short-term goal and a long-term goal because I actually don't think people know us very well. Those listeners out there, um, in terms of where we come from, listeners. our army of listeners and our our haters out there that send us bombs are completely the mail. unaware of <laughs> any relevant details oh, as yes, to who we they are. Don't know us at all. No. 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 But. Um, I'd say short-term goal in my life recently, I would have to say for Jake, the short-term goal right now is to get a better job. Uh, for those who are unaware, I work two jobs for about, I'm in one place for five years. I was at one place for three years. What, oh, what's going on, dude? Anyway, I'm just going to keep going. So like, <laughs> what are you laughing at? Anyway, I was at one job for three years and I left it last year. And uh, it was it was a very poignant part of my life. I also left uh, youth ministry at that point, and then uh, I was been at this one job I've had since I think for five or six years now. And so I applied for a different position just yesterday. I applied for three different positions in the in the entity I'm working at, is what I'll say. And it's in the education system, but I'm very uh, hopeful to see what comes of that. And it's interesting because in that short term goal. I guess my long-term goal is to become financially stable so that I'll be like prepared, I guess, more prepared, I guess, for when future Mrs. Jake Metzger comes along, <laughs> which we never know when that'll be, but only God knows. But I think it's cool because right now, I think God's working behind the scenes a lot from what I've been noticing and or what I actually haven't been noticing. I believe God, David... God, David, David, God. I believe, David, that God, <laughs> that God is working a lot in behind the scenes right now in my life. And he probably always has, and I just haven't really been paying attention. But now I've kind of been paying more of attention to it and bringing more attention to just kind of diving into the word and being more, being more intentional about reading the Bible, which is something I have always struggled with. Oh, yeah. But I'm really glad that it's kind of, man, it's given me such a breath of fresh air the last couple of months where I'm like, especially the start of this year where I'm like diving into it and I'm like, man, this is like, even though life happens, bad things happen. I, it, when we started this podcast, it was our well had issues, our well went out and then a telephone pole fell against our house. And then um, I think our refrigerator broke right after that. And so like all these things happened and like, uh, the last like uh, what was it eight months or so, David? Like, there's a lot been that's been going on and and where we live here. So, it's funny how even though all those bad things happen, um, there's always an appreciation for life and always a a great. Um, it's always great to having to refocus on things. It's kind of a reset when bad things happen to you, especially catastrophe and that kind of thing. But anyway, I would just say short term goal for me is Mr. Jake is a uh, financially stable and long term goal is. I don't know, Mrs. Future Mrs. Jake Metzger, wherever you're at, honey. I don't know. Come on down. <laughs> He's waiting for you. If she's listening to this in the future, she'll probably be like, 
man, he had no idea. And and, uh, you're correct. I had no idea. (laughs) I mean, who really does? Who really does? Nobody does. So, but uh, what's a short term goal for you, David? I almost called you Steve. Before before, before I dive into that, what were you laughing at? I have to tell you what I was laughing (laughs) at. Okay. So when you said, are you looking at memes or something? What's going on? No, 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 no. When I've got my Wi Fi disabled, I don't (laughs) want anything. (laughs) I thought you said waifu. (laughs) (laughs) I got my waifu disabled. Oh man. Um anyway. <laughs> yeah, so when I'm you go give me another Arizona. <laughs> oh, so when you said uh that you wanted to get a better job, it instantly oh, no. Oh, no. it instantly reminded me of a South Park episode. Um and it's all about uh wrestling and the kids start like it's a f- great episode. Anybody who uh is is uh open to the idea of watching South Park should uh, I should, should check that episode out? It's great. Um, but yeah, the kids start like a WWE style wrestling thing after uh, trying after trying out wrestling in school and learning that it's not the same thing at all and being disappointed. And it gets real popular with the townspeople. And the the school wrestling coach is like basically gets fired from his job as a result. Oh, no. Did PC principal fire him? Oh no, PC principal is different. Uh, th- yeah, this is before PC mm, principal. Mm-hmm, um, mm. And so he is like down on his luck because no one's interested in real, like actual wrestling anymore. They're all interested in the WWE type stuff. And so he, <laughs> at one point, he like comes, he like interrupts one of the, the their WWE style matches to like go on a rant about to go on a rant about um what he's been going through and unknowingly he sort of like inserts himself in as a character into the you know the drama that is wwe style wrestling so he's he's basically telling his whole life story and people are like the first they're angry at him for interrupting the show and then he's like and then he was he's like he's like and they took my job. And then you see in the stands is like the one dude's like, they took his job. <laughs> and then another, and then another guy in the stands is like, they took his job. They took his job. And then it's just because, you know, the series is, all, it's like a redneck Colorado town. Oh, yeah. So they're all rednecks. Um, yeah. They're just like, they took the bird. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. And so yeah, when you uh when you said that, it just reminded me of that. It was like they took his job. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it broke me for a second. <laughs> yeah, David had his hand in his hands. I'm like, like what's so funny about leaving a job? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why oh, that man. that I, that my brain connected to those two things, but it did. <laughs> job <laughs> it was good stuff oh, okay so okay, anyway so short-term goal for you right now in your life yeah yeah as well as a long-term goal so i i would say that the short-term goal for me would be to uh just kind of get a better get better control of my life mm. you know undo some bad habits learn some better habits mm. be better a better steward of my finances. Be better. Um, try to live healthier, you know, eat healthier, work out more. So my short-term goal is, I think, is just to try and get some forward momentum, you know? Mm. Because I'm going to be, I'm going to be kind of real here. I've been pretty, I've been pretty tired for the past, like, probably been a, a, for about a year or so. I've been like, mm. I've been pretty tired. I've been kind of mm. exhausted, yeah. you know. And I'm not gonna say I'm like the most busy person on the planet, but I'm pretty busy. Pretty busy. You're pretty busy, yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's I just kind of like I've been feeling a little overwhelmed. Mm. And you know, it's not. I can't necessarily take a vacation or drop what I'm doing, you know. So I've just my short term goal is to just kind of get some forward momentum better myself, get some better habits going, get a little healthier just so I'm better able to deal with the, uh, you know, the stress of day-to-day life. Yeah. Yeah. 
I've been um, kind of being influenced by a lot of uh, things I'm following in terms of like healthiness and fitness and that kind of thing. And, you know, I'm a pretty big guy. I've always been a big guy, but it'd be kind of nice to kind of focus more on that, especially just starting out maybe just with weights or something. Cause that's what I have. You want to get cut. Gonna get, gonna get some gains. <laughs> you go, what are you cutting? I'm cutting. No, give me a diet, Dr. Pepper. I'm cutting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think diet soda is the way forward. Now. <laughs> Shout out to the Hodge twins, man! I love those guys so much. Like, give me a they they do those like f- like they did like videos for a long time where they're just in the drive through at Taco Bell or something. They're like, give me a, a diet Dr Pepper because I'm cutting. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh no, give me a give me no cheese because I'm cutting. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That's oh funny. god i love them so so much they do more political stuff now but it's like their food stuff and fitness stuff was freaking hilarious so anyway that's where my inspiration's coming from because <laughs> the old Hodge twins but in all seriousness i was trying to figure out i'm like i'm hearing podcasts and listening to things where people are like yeah you know i'm trying to get my home gym going and it's so much it saves me so much time from versus driving 15 minutes to the to the to the gym and we live far away from town, so it's like even more of a drive. So I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, that I was thinking about that. And, and would that work out? Would that be better? You know, but it's like, I think it's, there's a guy on Twitter. His name's Dave. And he's a guy that I think he was like 400 plus pounds. And he's been on this journey for about two years now. I remember following him. For his, he put a picture up. He's like, all right, I'm going to start tackling weight loss. And he, in the last two years, went from being super, super depressed, overweight, single, to kind of changing his whole life around and his mentality. And he works full time, so he's still doing this, but he would get up at 4 a.m. and hit the gym. And it's just a planet fitness, nothing special. And he'd just go there and, and just continually do that. And he found happiness, more energy, and all this kind of stuff. And I look at that and I'm like, it's really inspiring and really cool. I don't know if I could get up at four in the morning every day. Definitely not. But I look at that and the success that's the success that's come from that for him and kind of him going viral as well is really cool. Not that I want to go viral or anything, but like just to get better. And even if it's step by step, you know, because it's a process at the end of the day. So anyway, I'll let you continue, David. Yeah. So that's pretty much my short term goal is just. Just to get a better handle on, you know, my habits and my health and all that. Mm. Just, um, you know, just so I can, uh, I'm better able to uh, deal with the things that I need to deal with, you know, yeah. move forward in my life. I think we always talk about intentionality with the media, David. I think it's also important to bring up intentionality of just life choices, you know. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to ask yourself, like, why you're doing something or why you're still doing something, you know, and why can't I do more or less with that? And I think you brought a vacation, which made me think like, sorry, I'm taking up all your time here. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but you brought a vacation and it made me think of like, yeah, vacation would be nice, I guess, but it's kind of, kind of important to kind of find a, a period of time in your usual routine to introduce something new, whether it be just setting a timer for like 15 minutes and reading the Bible or something. Um, that's why we say intentionality with media. Cause we want to be intentional about our media, even though it's easy to scroll on Instagram for me or to scroll through Twitter or just sit there and listen to a podcast versus not doing anything, you know, but continue. I'm sorry. I'm taking too much. I'm telling too <laughs> no, much. No, 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 it's all good. It's, yeah, it's, what what you're talking about is kind of the same thing that I'm going through. Is <laughs> that was weird? I don't know where that came from. Um, yeah. So well, the stuff you're talking about is kind of kind of the reason why my goals are what they are. Mm. Um, and as for long term goals, that's a little bit more. Mm. That's a little bit more up in the air, you know. Because mm. it's like I don't know what the future holds. But I would say that for one thing, for sure, I wanna, I wanna start investing. 
I want to diversify my diversify my portfolio. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to diversify my uh, income sources for sure, and Ooh. I also want to figure out how a way to monetize um, my music. That Ooh. I think yeah. would be a, a long term goal for me, as well as what you were talking about. Mm. I want Mrs. David Reed to come into the picture. Yeah, we're both single guys, so yeah, we're both yeah. But um, if you couldn't tell, no, I'm, jo- <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, yeah, yeah. I think um, I'll be. I, I'll bring up a great. I'll say something here, David. I've noticed in terms of the last couple of months, your behavior has been a lot about discovering new things and kind of diving into it. And I've done this. Uh, I think everybody's done this actually. Where like you find something new and you're like, oh, that's kind of cool, and you do more research and get into it. Um, I think it started with you. I'm just only thinking about this year actually, but I think the emulation stuff kind of started it from what I've noticed. And, and we kind of started our podcast before that and whatnot. And, and you're diving into logic, for example, you're diving into more different things and in media wise, I've, I, I wasn't trying to spy, but I was going to go shut the window in the studio last night and I saw uh, Nexus mods from Skyrim on the webpage, and I'm like, oh, shoot, is he going to play Skyrim? Is he going to get into the modding scene? That'd be dope. That'd be awesome. <laughs> and so like, I just noticed um, these like behaviors in that kind of area of your life where you're like discovering new things, you're investing your time in it, you're figuring things out. I mean, we talked about the whole emulation thing with A Link to the Past multiplayer, which is super fun, and your SNN is classic, and just these smaller things I see that could lead down the road to bigger things. You're having this discovery phase from what I've observed in these areas. And it seems like, especially with the audio stuff too, I mean, you're always kind of doing that as well, but you could also translate it and use those capabilities in other aspects. And I think you'll be surprised by how well it translates. I don't know. What do you think? Who's to say really? Who's to say? (laughs) Um, but I've kind of given a lot of thought to this. Like, how do I translate my interest into this, into this? Yeah. You know? Like, how do I translate video games into working out? Like, how do I do that, you know? I know you can get a Fitbit or a watch or whatever and kind of track your stuff and make a game out of it. So that kind of sounds fun. But there's there's got to be other ways to do it, too, how to make it fun. One thing that I will say, the Dave guy I mentioned on Twitter, I think his name's Dave Dana or Dana or something. He's a cool guy. I'd uh, suggest looking him up. Um, but one thing he'd said, he was interviewed at one point, and he said, and he said I just go to the gym, I just do what's fun. And I just find what's like, like, like fun to do instead of like doing all these squats or doing all these push-ups or whatever. I, he's like, I kind of just started with like walking, kind of doing a little bit of weight stuff, a little bit of uh, cardio, and just started doing that. And I think now he's at like 230 or 40 pounds. So he's lost like 160 plus pounds, which is really amazing. Um, and it's one of those great stories of like, oh man, if he can do it, I can do it. But for me, I'm like, eh, 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 whatever. Yeah. But now I'm like realizing I'm like, well, I'm only getting older. So maybe I should do something about it. You know, maybe, but maybe, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> but, um, I think it kind of calls back to what we were talking about earlier. Like, what are you going to be doing it for, you know? And to get, you know, you kind of want to ask yourself that. You know, you kind of want to keep going with it. So, yeah, kind of interesting. But um, anything else happened in David's life? Any, um, I know you've been like, you never get a break from worship team, from what I've noticed. I mean, you're the leader of the worship team at our church for sure. But like, Seems, man, you just don't catch a break, brother. What's going uh, on? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. It's like, um, like you know, the there's been some some changes over the years. Um, as long as I've been a part of the worship team of of our of this church, um, and. Wow, uh, sorry. <laughs> My brain just went... <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's been a lot of change I've seen over the years, and people have come and gone, and mm-hmm. 
and uh, ebb and flows. Yeah, and one of the things that I've noticed, not to this is definitely not to toot my own horn, by the way. It's okay. Uh, yeah. This is just one of the things I've noticed is yeah. I'm mm-hmm. kind of been like the constant element for uh, a number of years now. Mm. And, mean, you know, it's just, I guess. I would say more, even more than worship, even like at other church events and other Bible studies, like you're like, a, it's like David's always there at those things, you know. Nah. But uh, for worship, for worship, specific, yeah, for worship yeah. specifically, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that, yeah, I've just been kind of. It's I've always been kind of the the one to to make the to do it whether regardless of who whoever else happened to be there at the time. And it's not that it's not because I'm an amazingly great person. It's more because the Lord has just kind of I think gifted me with the ability to do it and do it consistently. And really Mm. it's his call on my life. It's the reason I'm doing it. That's Mm. the, that's really all just to, it's all to bring him glory in whatever way I can. And so he's called me to this position of doing worship for the, for our church. And I've been able to be so constant at it just simply because <clears throat> of just simply because of the grace that he supplies. Mm. That's really all it comes down to is the grace he supplied in my life to do this specific thing has really been what kept me going. Like if I had been doing this under my own strength, I would have burned out a long time ago. Mm, yeah. And that's, that's really, that's really the thing about life is you got to rely on the Lord. Mm, amen. Whatever it is you find yourself doing, you have to rely on the Lord. You have to rely on the grace that he supplies day by day to get through. Because mm. if you're doing it in your own strength, eventually you're going to get burned out and you're going to fail. Yeah. And I'm in my natural self. I am not what you would call a driven individual. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I, mean, I, yeah, I have, you, I have you, things, yeah. I have things that I want to accomplish, but yeah. I'm not, I'm not some like high powered CEO who, you know, he's always on the grind, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely not that kind of guy. I'm definitely not that kind of guy. That's not my personality. Mm. Um, but I've been able to be so consistent and so driven in just in doing worship simply because I allow the Lord to uh, to do it through me. Mm. That's really the long and short of it. Amen. Um, it's it's interesting, like the the path I've seen you on, just observing from afar. And I just think that the Lord is going to do just amazing things in your life. I think you're on the right path, dude. And you know, sometimes I get worried about. It. I'm like, man, is David okay? He's going to burn. But it seems like you got your head on the right on on right. So. I'm not worrying about that. I don't think I got to worry about you for anything. So you're a cool guy, man. I just encourage you and be like, because I know what I think would be cool in your life, but I think God has a better idea of what would be cool in your <laughs> life, you know? Like, I think the music thing is really dope and really awesome. And I think he's going to do great works with you through that. Um, but yeah, all in the Lord's timing, man. All in due time. Um, in terms of burnout, I think it's uh, it's... So it's, burnout's interesting to me because it's so something that I've always experienced in my life. Always, 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 especially um, the the job I mentioned that I had for three years. I was doing that and the one I am currently in. And I did youth ministry on the weekend. So it was like with only me and Steven. And it was like who we're actually going to get on uh, in the next couple of weeks here. We're going to get Steven on to do a podcast. So it's interesting because we, me and him were talking about this in youth group and, and our time with it. And I left at one point, I think it was last year I left 
it was funny how the Lord worked it out because I thought I would be part of youth group for like forever maybe, or maybe not in maybe like leave and then come back um, like later in my life. But like, it turns out it happened all last year where like I left youth group at the same time I left that other job, that second one I was talking about. And it all happened at the same time. During that time in my life, I imagined, oh, I'm going to leave the one I've had the longest, stay at the second job, also do youth group and kind of find another job on the side with my schedule and blah, blah, blah. But the Lord had other plans. And through that journey in the last year, I would say, has been really eye-opening to me in what he has in store. And also during that last year, I would say he's revealed stuff to me where I'm like, is this a possibility? And he's like, yeah, that's a possibility. And I can provide for you that. And I was like, what? No way. And I don't know full details. It's always changing, I would say, in terms of visually what things look like in my future. But again, got to just rely on the Lord. Um, we were at, <laughs> say the, say the, uh, they shall not be named, they who shall not be named, but we were at Bethel uh, for a youth conference, uh, for a youth group. And it was really great, really cool, a great experience for the kids. Kids got a lot out of it. And I went into that experience. It was like a, shoot, I can't remember what it was called, but it was a youth conference for like a weekend or something. And so we stayed at a church for one night, Friday night, went there Saturday, went there again Sunday. And it was, um, or maybe it was a two-day thing, I can't remember. Young Saints, that was what it's called. But we went to it, and I was at a point in my life where I was really burning out hard. I was, there was a lot of pressure on me for, Oh, let's see. When was this? This was, there's a lot of pressure put on me from my second job, a lot of pressure in youth group, even though we had more help at that point. And that wasn't just me and Steven. It was, it was more people. Um, and we were all doing our best to figure things out get along the house situation that I was in at that point uh, that we were both in was very crowded, not a whole lot of time to get away. And we were all just kind of spending time to together in, in every aspect of our life, which was very, very draining, but we all love each other and still friends and all that kind of stuff. And so I remember just all this stuff was happening when we were going to the Young Saints. And I remember going and I'm like, okay, I'm only going this thing just for the kids. Like, I don't care about anything that I get out of it. I'm not going for me at all. I really just want to go get it done and get this done for the kids and just be done with it. And then I remember going there and they had a part this is why they do this at, at, at many smart youth, many smart conventions. They took all the leaders and said, okay, we're, you guys can, you're going to have the, all the leaders go upstairs to the room above us. And you guys are going to, we're going to have a message for you, have some alone time with God, worship and all that kind of stuff. And only be for like an hour or something. So we, I think it was me. I think Heather stayed with the kids and it was me, Stephen and Matt went upstairs and it was like a really eye-opening thing where burnout was so real in everybody's life uh, who were leading youth ministry. And it was it, distinctly in the time we had to spend alone with God. And they would have people come up and pray for you. So you find your place in the room and then, you know, you need alone time with God and then people would come up and pray for you. And I remember I was really focused on this like image of my future I had, David, and I like was thinking about it constantly going over it. And in that year I had a lot of heartbreak, a lot of stuff happened to me. And then this guy comes up and prays for me. I'm like, okay, you know, usual stuff, you know, I don't even know if I kind of like this place in general, you know? And then like this guy comes up and prays for me and he says these words to me. He's like, he's like the plan that he has for you, man, he can provide you for that. The plan that you have right now in your brain the, the vision you have, the, the whatever company you want to start, he said, God's going to provide for that. And he's going to make a way for all it all to happen. And it just hit me in that moment. I was like, dude, this is exactly what I've been thinking about. And it was definitely the Holy Spirit ministry. And I didn't expect to get anything about that trip out of it at all. And it was wonderful and, and very delightful to see God bless, uh, bless me with that. And it was really cool because... Like I'm a very analytical person, so I analyze pretty much everything. And I was thinking a lot about my life and like the people that would I would stay connected with or not stay connected with, and what would they, if they would, would they connect with this future vision I have? And it turned out that the vision got clear and clear 
during that quiet time. And I was like, basically, it broke me down. Um, I don't know why I'm sharing the story, but <laughs> I just, uh, I think it's just important to, I don't know. I don't really know what I'm sharing. I'm just. Uh, I mean, I think yeah. well, it it definitely illustrates the importance of rely on, relying on God. You know, you can't do it in your own strength. You just can't. It, and we as humans, we weren't designed to be apart from the Lord. And unfortunately, mm. well, that ended up happening. But we weren't designed for that. We were designed yeah. for communion with him. Mm. And so I think it really, really underscores the importance of relying on the Lord. And I remember that time, too. I remember the time when you stepped away from youth group. And, um, you know, I understood. You, you got to do what you got to do. But at mm. the same time, I was a little sad because... Yeah. I kind of saw you were kind of like the glue that sort of made that help um, that particular leadership team function the way it did. Um, and so, and just, you were so um, good at forming relationships with the kids. And it was just like, man, I was like, I really hope he just like digs down and finds the strength within him to continue because like um you were like the what you were doing with the youth group was so was so great. Um but you know of course you had to do what you had to do. Mm. Um and but and I think it was a good in the long run though it was a good thing that you left because yeah, it yeah. I think it set a lot of other things in motion mm. that sort of revealed things that would not have been revealed otherwise. Mm. So the Lord really worked it in a good way. And now mm. you're back. I'm back after a you're very <laughs> long hiatus, <laughs> yeah. extremely long hiatus. <laughs> so For those who are unaware, David was actually a youth group leader when I was attending youth group as a teenager. So it was uh, very cool to see him back in it. But anyway, you continue. Sorry. Yeah, so it's just it's really cool how the Lord managed to work things out of what was a very bad situation. Yeah, I just I look back at it now and I'm like there was a ton of burnout, a ton of um just things happening in life, like relationship wise, a lot of stuff, transitions, seasons ending, beginning, all this stuff. And I think that I remember I had I wanted to meet with everybody. But I think only Stephen was available at the that night, and so I told him he was the first person I told him, and I said, "I think I'm gonna, hey man, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to leave um, for this reason and that, and you know, just burn out in general." And I, I remember that night he was sitting actually in the couch to my right here, and I was sitting in a chair, I think on the stool actually behind me, and then <laughs> it was um just a really, you know, very sad moment, but he was very understanding. It was very cool to see that. But I remember leaving it and I'm not just trying to toot my own horn, own horn at all, but I remember when I was leaving, I'm like, we're in a really good state right now in terms of where the youth group is at. And I kind of would like to leave now just to leave it in a good place because I don't, uh, I just feel like it's time to, time to go. And it, it was extremely sad. I remember doing that and I'm like, all right, I'm going to leave youth group and I'm going to leave my other, my first job when I've had the longest and it turned out, nope, I left youth group and I got <laughs> rid of the second job. Cause literally David, the week, the weeks following my announcement to Steven, to uh, Matt and Heather, to all these people, uh, to the church, everybody, to the weeks following that uh, turned out those were my last weeks at the second job. And that was a huge shock to my system. I remember after the, after I, the morning I left that job and I was kind of shaking because I'm like, this feels really weird. And it ended well. It was all, it was all on good terms. Um, but I remember driving to go feed cows because it was winter time. And so I had to go feed them. And I was like shaking in my car. Like I got home, got dressed, got my cow boots on. And I went over to the, the barn and, and was going to feed them. And I was like shaking as I was uh, done. Cause just, it felt like a shock to my system. Like all this change is happening and it feels so overwhelming and I'm like, what the heck do I do next? <laughs> like, what do I do? And, and so I eventually figured out what my next steps were. But I think it's just, um, it was such a bizarre 
point in my life and and maturing too and figuring things out. Um, I then tried to figure out what I was going to do and I thought I was going to go into a uh, water tending and it would drive a water truck, you know? And so I got everything in line and ready for that. All my ducks in the road took about six months, you know, from leaving the job to getting ready for a new one. And then fire seasons upon me and then or upon everybody. And then there was, and thankfully there were no fires, but that means there was no work for me. And so I got everything, everything done and good and lined up to go last year. And then the summer comes and then we don't get a call at all, which is good. I'm not saying it's wrong. Um, glad there was very little fires in, in our, in, in our vicinity and all that kind of stuff. Um, however, uh, that means I prepared pretty much for no, no work at all. <laughs> um, but it seems like this year it's going to be different. I still have all those things from last year. I'm re, re, redoing all of those trainings and all that and, and whatnot. And so it looks like this summer will be different, but also it's different because I'm applying to other positions too in my first job, I'll say. And we'll see where the Lord takes me. I've been, uh, we were, this last Sunday, our church went to real life church uh, with Pastor Jay and we had a joint service and David, you led worship and it was, it was sounded great and it was awesome. Um, and I, I've really felt like, man, I need some prayer for discernment. So I went up to Pastor Jay and the other, I can't remember the other guy, Pastor guy's name, but he's cool, cool old dude. And they both prayed for me and I did like, I just need a sermon and guidance, guide, guidance because I feel like we're all in need of that. But I really felt like I really need a prayer for it. And hopefully and prayerfully, like, and God will supply me with that, I'm, I know for sure. But it's been, the struggle for me has been discerning and figuring out where to go because like I've, you know, there's a lot of things going on in life. So it's just, uh, you got to stay focused and discerned, you know, discernment is, is key to all this. So, I mean, the discernment is why I left youth group in the first place was like, I feel like this is the right time and the way things are lining up and the way things are going, it seems like this is the point to leave, you know? So, and there's semantics and details that don't need to be said about it, but that's just the basics of it. Like, you know, there's a lot more to the story and maybe it'll be told one day, but all in all, I think all that, when it gets down to brass tacks is, it was just, it was time. But now you and me are part of the leadership now too. So curious to see where it goes. Um, That's weird how things work out, you know? Yeah. Why? You said you were called to return to leadership. Um, what was your thought process starting that? Um. So it was just. Also, how long were you a leader in the your prior time? Let's see. Yeah, I how long was, ago was that? uh well so we'll start with the the before time. The before time. <laughs> um so basically I was a long time youth group kid. Mm. You know, I started in seventh grade. Um right around the time when yeah, it was right right around the time when Thad fully took over. Mm. Um is when I started going to youth group. And so I went all through junior high, all through high school. And um, so it just kind of felt natural to transition into a leadership role when I came of age. And so I did that, I think, for, I did that, I think, for, I want to say, like I wasn't a leader leader right away. Like I was like, turned 18 and I would go just to kind of either like help out. Mm. You're a, vol you a volunteer. Yeah. Help yeah. out. And then also, you know, I wanted to hang out with like Thad and Mandy, you know, cause yeah. that was like the time cause we, we had become friends at that point. So that was, you know, I I'd go to help out and then I'd hang out with Thad and Mandy basically. And then, so I think, but I think I transitioned to leadership. Oh, you're, Around probably when I turn probably when I turn twenty one. Mm, okay. Um and I was there probably I was there for probably like three or four years, I would say. I mean I could be remembering wrong, but that's what I remember is 
I was I was in leadership for about three or four years after I turned 21. Mm. And then um, I just had to step away because uh, my work schedule wouldn't allow um, me to be free on Saturdays. And it just, yeah, it just wasn't working out for me. So I had to step step away. And then for a number of years, I just had no desire to return. Because I don't really. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a crotchety old man at heart. <laughs> I don't uh I don't have the patience to deal with teenagers. So for a lot of years I was good not to return. <laughs> I was just like, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to focus like worship was really my thing as far as ministry goes. Worship was really my thing. I was just going to focus on that. Mm. And then how long ago was did the thing, the, the happening, the thinginging. Uh, that was this this year at about February. Yeah, February. yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah. Um, the transition. Yeah. The 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 day <laughs> that shall live in infamy. <laughs> it was the youth group snow trip, and it was a big announcement, and um, uh, leadership was going to take a step back, um, take a focus on family, and then uh, uh, Nick and Nicole, our pastors, were like, "Oh, well." Yeah, we're gonna gonna kind of take it over for now and see where it goes and uh, keep it going. You know. Yeah, yeah. Because so, we need it for the kids. So, mm-hmm. so basically, yeah, it was, that had just happened. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh. Well, this was before. Uh, this was before they announced it. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh. So oh. this was oh, before right. they. Yeah, 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 this, yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. was before they announced it. Mm. Um. This was before they announced it. Um. But I knew it was coming down the pipeline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we had a uh, a soak night mm. at our church. It was like basically, um, it's like a worship night we had. Yeah, at it was church. basically yeah, yeah just like a, a night night of worship. Yeah, and so um, yeah. you probably remember the day because it was. We had a land party that same day. I, yeah, I remember. I remember. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, lost, I lost my voice <laughs> the day before, and I could not talk the entire day. That was funny. You remember that? Uh, yes, I yeah, remember yeah, that. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Um, that, was, that, was, that was... It was, it was, it was a weird... It was a weird... It was a weird time. It was a weird time. <laughs> overall. But yeah, so we had a land party that day, and then later that night, we had a soak night, mm. and I knew about that the leadership transition was in the pipeline Mm -hmm. and it was on my mind. And I just remember just being in prayer and worship that night and just like, no matter what I was praying about, no matter what I was worshiping about, no matter what was going on around just like this thought, this idea of me back in youth leadership just kept popping up, mm. just kept popping up, kept popping up, kept coming to my mind. Mm. And I was just like, I was just like, yeah, that would be interesting, but I don't want to do that. <laughs> and it just kept popping up, kept popping up, kept popping up. Mm. I was like, you know what? Maybe this is the Lord trying to tell me something. Mm. And... So I prayed about it. I got some counsel from some people who I trust. And I came to the conclusion that the Lord was just calling me back into youth ministry. Mm. And you know, it's it's weird. I didn't really have any desire in my natural self to return, that's for sure. Yeah. But I just felt the call. And so I followed it. Mm. And let me tell you, it's not been what I would call a rewarding experience in the natural. (laughs) Is youth ministry ever a very rewarding experience? It's been (laughs) just another thing to take up my time. Mm. And, you know, another, (laughs) they're going to see another, another thing to contribute to my general lack of sleep and rest. 
<laughs> and yet, and yet, and yet, mm. I don't feel it's the same thing with worship. It's like yeah. I don't feel like I'm in danger of burning out. Yeah, as the Lord has supplied me with the grace to do it. I'm operating in faith that His call is on me for this specific thing, and that He supplies the grace for it. Mm. And so far. That's the way it's been. Even though in the natural, it's been quite stressful. Because yeah. I was busy before, and now here's another thing on my plate. <laughs> and working with teenagers is not a rewarding experience. <laughs> Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying to you, <laughs> or they're lying to themselves. <laughs> it's not fun to work with teenagers. I mean, it's fun in a certain sense, <laughs> but... Overall, it's uh-huh. it's quite. It's not. It's not. An, um, it's it's not something you want to do. It's definitely know? a burden that you take yeah, on. Yeah. It's not like, yay, I want to do this. <laughs> um, but I'm just operating in faith that the Lord mm. that the Lord has placed this call on my life for this specific purpose, mm. and that He's supplying me the grace in order to do it. Mm. And uh, so far, it's it's worked out. Yeah, I remember that um, the snow day is when I, I found out about uh, the transition like everybody else did. And I was like, oh, okay, interesting. But Because I remember the year before, like nearly a year to the month, was when I left youth group. And when I, my last trip, I announced it two weeks before our snow trip. And so my snow trip I announced would be my last thing I'd do. Uh, in February. And so I remember leaving that day. I think it was Stephanie that came up to me that la- last year when this, when I was, when we got back to Pi- uh, got back to Walgreens or whatever from the mountains. And I remember we, I parked in the parking lot to get out and she's like, Hey, you, she's like all sad. And I'm like, what was wrong? And she's like, I didn't know this was your last trip. I'm like, Oh yeah, it is. I'm, I'm leaving after this. She's like, Oh, so it was, you know, it was sad. But, and then this next year, this year, it was on a snow trip that it was announced. And then like after when we met at Walgreens again, um, we were talking with Nick and Nicole and I was like, Hey, you know what? Count me and I'll be at the meeting and we'll figure it out. I, I can be there and support you guys. And so that was my idea. And I was like, eh, you know what? I don't know if I'll get back into this. I, I about once a month. Okay. I can do once a month. That's fine. And then. I've kind of been there pretty much every Saturday from there. And it's, it's, I agree with you too. It's the Lord provides me energy for it. Grace for me to provide grace and mercy dealing with teenagers, you know, like, like you do. Um, but again, I'm not super tired like I was before. It's different, I would say. And I'm actually uh, having a good time doing it, even though it you know takes energy, it takes time and, takes investment but again it's it's the lord is so so good david so i think that it's interesting to see the i'm i don't want to bring up like the history of this youth group cuz it's been around a long long time in fact my parents i think led it at one point in like the 80s or 90s or something like it's been around a while and even before them and i think it's just a very consistent thing in our community and it's cool to see that and it's a thing that's been around even longer than some churches, in fact. Um, in fact, that is a fact. Um, but I think it's not good to do it just for the sake of it, but also like God has done wondrous works in the community through this youth group. And I'm just excited to see what he does through these kids now as well and to build that relationship with them and to help them seek God and grow. Because um, as we all know, when you're a teenager, and this is something I've always told the teenage kids, I'm like, hey, you're at the age right now where you are transitioning into the person you are going to be for the rest of your life. And what do you want that person to be? What kind of habits are you going to take with you into adulthood? What kind of thought patterns? What kind of people are you going to keep relationships with? What are you taking into adulthood? Because you're going to be adult the rest of your life. You're going to be who you are. The The teenage years are cementing your personality and everything, habits and all. 
And so it's such a crucial moment to uh, not figure out who you are. That's not the right word. It's to figure out your path and to figure out God's work in your path. And I think that from personal experience, all the crap I've seen people go through and what I've experienced personally, I mean, I can't imagine not having God in my life and not having that relationship with him. And, and like I've, I've said before, like I struggle reading the Bible. It's hard for me to read and, you know, but he is really good and, and his goodness surpasses all mistakes. And yeah, I think that it's just important. It's key. It's a key. Cause when you're a kid, you're a sponge and you can only soak up so much by the time you get to an adulthood. So with the youth ministry specifically, I think it's uh, God provides so much grace and mercy to to us, and, and I'm so grateful for him for that. So, yeah, God is good. All the time. And all the time, God is good, Well, <laughs> Anyway. But, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I don't know where it's going to go from here. I don't know how long or how much longer I'll be with it or if I'm going to stay with it, but I just know that for the time, for the season, David, um, we're doing what we're supposed to do. So, oh, yeah. Well, David, I think we did pretty good. Oh, um, yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about or bring up or say or a word from the Lord before we uh, wrap up this topic? A blessing. A blessing from the Lord. A blessing from the Lord. I'm sorry, I had to quote Monty Python there. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th- I think we pretty much covered it. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we just got done with our podcast and I don't have a laptop in front of me. So we did pretty good. There yeah. were no notes. The page was blank. So it was pretty good. Turn the page. Turn the page. I, there's a song called Turn the Page. I'm sure. But yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know who, who does it. Did you ever watch Page Master growing up? The movie? I think I've seen it. The one with the little kid and he turns into a 2D animated kid and it's a 2D animated world magic. He goes into a book. I mean, I don't Macaulay know. Macaulay Culkin. Is yeah, the kid. I, I don't have any specific memories of it, but I think I've seen it at some point. But I don't know. I remember it, it was really dark, kind of like a lot of those movies back. Then. A lot of those movies. A back lot in of the those day. kids' movies, man. Yeah. Like uh, Labyrinth. Oh, have oh, you ever man. seen that? I've not. I also haven't seen Black Cauldron either. You've never seen Black <sighs> Cauldron. Here we go. Yes, I haven't seen Black <laughs> Cauldron. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well. Just wait till I tell you I haven't seen The Matrix either, so that's going to be a... Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to the sn- another episode of the Snart Fangle Podcast. We appreciate you so much for your time and your uh, your wonderful comments you've left, and, and just uh, thank you for letting us be in your ears. And We're going to pay adieu now and uh, Snart Fangle on. Bye-bye now. <laughs>